Good morning, I'm Tasarat Sudabud Vatsaranan. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the 29th Illinois Ann Ear Infirmary Glaucoma Symposium. Although this year we cannot meet each other in person, we have opportunity to invite our international colleagues also to join us. So I, I would like also to welcome our colleagues from Thailand, Swatika, and from the Middle East, from India and for Asia as well. We will have a half day lecture from glaucoma experts around the country, including two named lectures, the Schoenberg lecture and the Walensky lecture, and four invited speakers with seven faculty members from the infirmary. I hope you enjoy the symposium and please feel free to send in comments, feedback, questions, or even say hi in the chat box. And please look out for our evaluation and CME forms in the follow-up email after the meeting. And lastly, I would like to also thank our team for working very hard to make this virtual meeting happen. That includes Peter Munn, who will be uh, co-hosting this morning as well, Lawrence Kolonowski, Laurie Walker, and Anita Horta for their hard work and our exhibitors, um, New World Medical and Aries for participating this year. So our first session will be the novel therapy. This session will be moderated by Dr. Deepak Edward. Dr. Edward, he's a professor of ophthalmology and also our vice chair for education. Good morning, Dr. Edward. Yes, I got to unmute myself. Good morning and thank you. So I'm excited to moderate this first session on novel therapy. And without much ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Henry. Uh, Dr. Henry is our superstar fellow here at UIC and uh, almost finished with his fellowship and will be heading down to sunny Arizona from Fort Chicago. Uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Hello. My name is Mike Henry, and I'm one of the current Glaucoma Fellows here at the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary. My talk today is titled, Novel Medical Therapy, From New Drugs to New Delivery System. I have no financial disclosures. Pharmaceuticals are the current cornerstone of glaucoma therapy. Although the light trial clearly demonstrated the effectiveness of first-line SLT, Topical ophthalmic agents remain the most common first-line therapy. Eye drops are extremely effective and play a critical role in preventing glaucoma progression and future incisional surgery. Despite these benefits, patient compliance is lower than eye professionals think. One study using pharmacy claims data showed that patients filled prescriptions for topical prostaglandin analogs and had a medication available for dosing only 37% of the days in a year. This non-adherence has consequences. The Collaborative Initial Glaucoma Treatment Study demonstrated a statistically and clinically significant association between medication at non-adherence and glaucomatous vision loss. This poor compliance likely stems from cost, inconvenience, and toxic side effects from the medication. The prolonged use of eye drops preserved with benzalkonium chloride is a strong risk factor for ocular surface disease in patients with glaucoma. BAK's toxic, pro-inflammatory, and detergent effects have been shown experimentally and can lead to irritation, dry eye, allergy, subconjunctival fibrosis, or increased risk of glaucoma surgery failure. BAK is found in consumer products such as hand sanitizers, wet wipes, mouthwashes, Lysol, and algicides. Reducing the overall preservative load may improve adherence, quality of life, and the patient-doctor relationship. Allergan's bimatoprost implant, along with Glaucose's iDose and Ocular Therapeutics Travaprost implant, have potential to improve adherence and reduce treatment burden in glaucoma. Bimatoprost SR, or Darista, is an FDA-approved intracameral implant that releases bimatoprost over time. The device is very easy to use. Here, I will outline the steps. Darista is removed from the storage refrigerator and opened. 
We first inspect the applicator. We ensure the 28 gauge needle is not bent, that the actuator button is not pressed, and that the blue safety tab is in place. When we are ready to use the device, we remove the blue safety tab by pulling straight perpendicularly out from the applicator. Then we remove the safety cap. The applicator is held with the thumb on the back half of the actuator button and the middle finger supporting the opposite side of the applicator. The eye is prepped under standard aseptic conditions for intracameral procedures and the patient is positioned at the slit lamp with or without a lid speculum. The 28 gauge needle enters the anterior chamber and the actuator button is pressed. The implant then settles to the inferior angle. The implant is made of polymers that slowly release bimatoprost as it biodegrades through the process of hydrolysis into carbon dioxide and water. In vivo studies show that the implant releases a continuous dose of bimatoprost for 90 days. However, Phase 1 and 2 studies showed that a single administration of Durista lowered intraocular pressure for up to one year in 40% of patients and up to two years in 28% with no additional treatment. Phase 3 studies followed patients who underwent three consecutive injections spaced out by four months. The probability of not requiring additional IOP lowering treatment for one year after the final implant was 82.1%. The implant stops emitting drug at 90 days and the drug is not detectable in the eye 120 days after injection. So why and how are the effects of the medication sustained up to one or even two years? Long-term treatment with topical bimatoprost has been shown to cause changes in morphology in the ciliary body and trabecular meshwork consistent with the formation of new outflow channels and enhanced outflow. The hypothesis is that the targeted delivery and higher concentrations of bimatoprost achieved in outflow tissues with Durista compared with topical dosing cause greater upregulation of matrix metalloproteinase activity in the target tissues and more durable tissue remodeling resulting in sustained IOP lowering. This long-term tissue remodeling is probably one of the most exciting and intriguing aspects of the intracameral implant that came out of the Phase 3 Artemis study and may one day truly be a game changer for our field. However, there was also some troubling data regarding endothelial cell loss that was also uncovered. In the Phase 3 studies, patients were given three administrations of Durista at fixed 16-week intervals. The incidence of 20% corneal endothelial cell density loss was 10.2%. Additionally, 3 out of 396 implant-treated subjects had a greater than 2-line best corrected visual acuity loss at their last visit. There were no such events in the Phase 1 and 2 trials where the majority of patients received one implant and time in between readministration and those who received two implants was much longer. Nevertheless, as a result of these corneal endothelial cell loss data in the phase three trial, reinjection of Durista is currently off label and it is not recommended in those with compromised corneal endothelium. If I were to describe my May 2021 view of Durista, I would say it is similar to femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery. Is it useful for certain cases? Yes. Is it exciting technology? Absolutely. Now, in its current form, should it replace how we do things? No. Should we use it in certain patients? Yes. I do not consider Durista a long-term solution. However, it can provide patients time. Time for the ocular surface to heal, time for patients to recover from medical issues, time for family members to arrange schedules. In time, this technology will advance and provide sustainable and safe long-term solutions for our patients. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Henry, for an excellent talk, and we'll uh, hopefully have more questions during the discussion period. Uh, the next talk is by me, uh, Trabs and Zen, where are we headed? Uh, the first part uh, of the talk is given by me, and the second part by Dr. Javaner Bassian. Peter. 
Good morning and welcome to the 2021 UIC Glaucoma Symposium. My talk this morning is not really about a competition between Zen and Trab, but to re-emphasize the importance of keeping trabecolectomy high in our toolbox of glaucoma surgical procedures. Following my presentation, Dr. Abbasian will share some insights into our experience with the Zen implant. In the next few slides, I hope to convince you why trabeculectomy probably is among the most useful filtration procedures we have available to us and our patients. The eye, as you all know, has limited conjunctival real estate around the globe. Using it carefully and wisely to lower intraocular pressure is really important. I think the most important reason why trabeculectomy still remains a top choice because it is time-tested and we know it works. There are around 7,000 publications related to this topic describing every possible variation in technique and outcomes. I would like to draw your attention to a paper by Dr. Wolinsky and Dr. Teresa Chen from approximately a quarter century ago where they looked at a cohort of patients who had follow-ups up to 15 years. If the TRAB was successful at one year, rates of IOP control and stabilizing progression were high. The TBT study somewhat jaded our view of the trabeculectomy success, but one needs to be reminded that the study was done in eyes that had previous surgery. The more recent tube versus trabeculectomy study at three years showed that the success rates were the same. Intraocular pressure lowering was lower in the TRAB group and complication rates were similar. A more recent study from Europe uh, using barbells versus trabeculectomy came to the same conclusion. Over the last decade, several improvements have been made in surgical technique and interventions to prevent complications and failure of trabeculectomy. Careful case selection, tissue hardening, and fibrosis control have improved outcomes. For example, intraoperative injection of mitomycin C or application of it with pledges over a large area have resulted in more diffuse bleb and reduction in bleb leaks. Careful handling of tissue and understanding the tissue planes at the limbus have resulted in better closure. Careful construction of the scleral flap has improved posterior aqueous outflow and tight and complete closure of the conjunctiva at the limbus has reduced incidences of bleb leaks. I would encourage all of you to read this paper by Peng Ha that describes the Moorfields Safer Trabeculectomy Surgery System, which describes several nuances in the technique of trabeculectomy that has improved the success rate of trabeculectomies at the Moorfields Eye Hospital. Trabeculectomy is a cost-effective procedure that needs simple instruments and sutures and is device-free as healthcare costs rise, it may be one day difficult to justify the use of additional devices to control intraocular pressure without strong evidence of the benefit of the device. There are, of course, several arguments that have been raised and some of them justified against trabeculectomy. Some of these are that there is a steep learning curve, post-op care is difficult, and there is a long list of complication rates both early and late. However, there is enough evidence in the literature and solutions offered to mitigate many of these concerns, showing that overall long-term success rates with trabeculectomy are superior. The Zen gelatin stent is the relatively new kid on the block, which is a tube of collagen-derived gelatin crosslinked with rutaldehyde. Its dimensions are given here, and it helps with controlled drainage of aqueous into the subconjunctival space. We are still learning indication, insertion techniques, intraoperative and postoperative management, and there are studies that are appearing in the literature describing the outcomes of this procedure. Before I end my talk, I would like to highlight the UIC connection to the ZEM implant. Dao Yu is Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Western Australia and the co-inventor of the ZEN implant. He was an ophthalmic pathology fellow with Dr. Mark Cho between 1989 and 1991. I have recently had some interesting conversations with him on how one could potentially improve the success rate of Zen implants, but that is a story for another day. Now over to Dr. Bassian, who will share our experiences with Zen. Thank you very much for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Edward, and thank you to the program committee for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to speak to you today about the Jesse Brown VA experience in using the Zen gel stent over trabeculectomy in finite cases. I have no financial disclosures. We're going to start with the case of AR, who is a 51-year-old African-American male with a history of severe POAG in both eyes. The patient has a history of an Ahmed tube shunt in the superior temporal quadrant of the left eye. He's NLP in the right eye and 2060 with eccentric fixation in the left. His intraocular pressure is 22 millimeters of mercury in the left eye on max topicals, including Repressa and Diamox one gram per day. His visual field is a 10-2 involving central fixation. So here we have a monocular patient with a history of a superior temporal Ahmed tube shunt in which we elected to do a superior nasal zen. We placed it with uh, 60 micrograms of subconjunctival mit mitomycin C at the time of the procedure. On post-op day one, the IOP was eight. He was only on Diamox and we started aggressive steroids. But by post-op week seven, his intraocular pressure rose to 22. At that time, he was off Diamox and all antihypotensive medications. And at the slit lamp, his uh, IOP lowered to approximately 10 with digital pressure. So we decided to sign him up for a needling with mitomycin C the subsequent week in the minor OR. Here you can visualize his Zen gel stent uh, in the superior nasal quadrant there. The tube is easily seen and it is straight and not kinked. Um, there's a low-lying bleb there to be seen, and the tube is very small in the AC, um, not visualized here. And here he is post-op week two after the needling. He has um, a very flat bleb, and on digital pressure, there's no um, elevation, and the pressure did not lower. He started at 18. At this point, the next step for us is to fracture the distal aspect of the Zen, thinking that that aspect is probably occluded. So here are some pearls from our learning curve at the Jesse Brown VA. First is regarding patient selection. We prefer to think about this in monocular patients who would have difficulty with the post-op course of a trabeculectomy. That also goes for those with, with poor social support and the inability to commit to both the vigorous eye drop regimen and also the uh, number of post-op visits often required for a trabeculectomy. We choose it in patients in need of a quick recovery and also those that have had a DSEC and have a low endothelial cell counts. And those that have had a prior tube shunt, likely in the superior temporal quadrant, but that have naive superior or superior nasal conge available. As far as intra-op pearls, we almost exclusively use the ab externo approach despite having previously used the ab interno. In African-American patients, we do a pyridomy and a possible tenonectomy if the patient has exuberant tenons. Our needle of choice is a 27 gauge needle, which allows some peritubular flow around the Zen. We also use mitomycin C sponges, but most often use intraconjunctival mitomycin C, approximately 45 to 60 micrograms total. And one last pearl for intra-op is to check the tube placement in the AC during closure as it can still move despite being hydrated by the BSS. We find that we're still babysitting the healing process here. We've decided also to needle the patients with mitomycin C prior to starting any antihypotensive drops. And ideally at that time, you can see the Zen and assess the ab external pr aspect prior to the needling. One important exam finding that will help you with the needling is the response to digital pressure. If the IOP falls with digital pressure, assume that there is flow through the Zen. At that point, you can needle the ring of steel adjacent to the Zen and above and below to ensure that it is free. If the IOP does not fall with digital pressure, that is likely due to a distal occlusion. At this point, you can either fracture the Zen or yag the internal ostium to reestablish flow. We have found in our hands that late needling is not very successful as compared to trabeculectomies. This is likely due to exuberant scarring in many of our patients. And I'll leave you with one post-operative surprise. While, while Zen gel stents usually yield a very low-lying bleb, we have been surprised by many of our post-op outcomes, including this picture of a very cystic elevated bleb 
much more resembling a trabeculectomy than that of a Zen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbasian, for that excellent talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Muhammad al Mala from Ocala, Florida. He's not a stranger to us. He is a former resident at our program, Dr. al Mala. Hi, I've been asked to speak to you today about MIGS, Minimally Invasive Glaucoma Surgeries, which procedure is best for my patient? These are my financial disclosures. There are lots of options when it comes to MIGS surgeries. Since the commercial launch of the eye stent in 2012, it seems like every year there's a new glaucoma surgery. How do we make sense of all these procedures? One way I like to think about it is to organize these surgeries by the site of action. So I think about where uh, these procedures are shunting fluid to. They're shunting fluid from the anterior chamber, for example, into the subconjunctival space. These are our traditional glaucoma surgeries, our trabeculectomies, tube surgeries, and the newer Zen device. Or we have the trabecular bypass procedures, such as the eye stand family or the hydrus device. These procedures are shunting fluid from the anterior chamber into Schlem's canal by bypassing the highest point of resistance to outflow, which is the trabecular meshwork. The third group of procedures are the goniotomy procedure, or procedures which disrupt the trabecular meshwork, either remove it or ablate it. And these include the hook dual blade, as well as trabectome, as well as the GAT procedure and the Omni 360 device, which can also be used to remove trabecular meshwork. And then finally, we have procedures in Schlem's canal itself. These are the canaloplasty procedures or the viscocanaloplasty procedure, where we're, where we're injecting viscoelastic into Schlem's canal to dilate canal and possibly remove any debris that's been built up. So, you can use the Omni360 device for this, for the ABIC procedure, the ab internal canaloplasty. I also like to consider the Hydrus device in this category because it does act like a scaffold and does scaffold open Schlem's canal. So back to the original question, which procedure is best for my patient? There are a few head-to-head uh, -head studies comparing these procedures. I'm going to share with you today what my personal experience is and what's worked for me in my practice and what hasn't. So before we consider which procedure we're going to do, we have to think about why it is we're doing surgery in the first place. There are two primary indications for surgery in our patient population. Basically, we want to either improve vision by doing cataract surgery or we're taking the patient to surgery to lower intraocular pressure. The pressure is uncontrolled and we want to get the pressure lower. It is my opinion that in the literature, we tend to confuse these two patient populations with each other. They're very different. In general, when we're taking a patient for cataract surgery, we're doing surgery to improve the vision. In general, the patient's pressure is already controlled before surgery, and we're simply doing a cataract procedure, the most commonly performed operation. A whole different population is patients who have uncontrolled glaucoma, uncontrolled intraocular pressure, and we're doing surgery to lower the intraocular pressure. MIGS devices can be used in both surgeries, but the choice of MIGS device and depends on what your ultimate goal is. So before we do surgery, let's think about the indication for surgery. If the primary indication for surgery is cataract removal, then we have several options as far as mixed procedures. And I tend to base, base my decision on the severity of the glaucoma. So we have to ask ourselves, this patient is undergoing cataract surgery, would they benefit from a mixed procedure at the same time? So in patients who have ocular hypertension or who are glaucoma suspects or, and they are not in any drops, then in general, I will just do cataract surgery alone. If these patients have mild glaucoma or ocular hypertension requiring the use of drops, then in general, I will choose to do cataract surgery combined with an eye stent. This will decrease 
the patient's need for drops and decrease their overall medication burden. We're not looking to get lower intraocular pressure. Remember, the pressure is already controlled before surgery. In patients who have moderate glaucoma, where our pressure target, let's say, for example, is mid-teens, then I will do either cataract surgery combined with a hydra device or cataract surgery combined with a Cahook dual blade goniotomy or KDB goniotomy. In my mind, these procedures are very similar as far as to the end uh, intraocular pressure that is achieved. I have not seen any head to head studies comparing these procedures. And so, in my mind, in my practice, I use these procedures uh, fairly interchangeably. And I'm still trying to figure out um, as far as which patients are best for these procedures. But for the sake of simplicity, I tend to group these two procedures together. So let's look at some other examples. Let's say you have a patient who has severe glaucoma, but controlled, and they have a cataract, they need cataract surgery. Which procedure would we do for these patients? I do either cataract surgery alone, or I have done cataract surgery with eye stent. I do the eye stent in these patients because the eye stent has an excellent safety profile. It's very rare that I have a complication or an issue with an eye stent, and for all intents and purposes, the post-operative management of a cataract patient is the same as that with a cataract combined with eye stent. I tend to not do um, the hydrus device or goniotomy procedure in these patients with severe glaucoma because they do carry with them some risk of bleeding. And with the, with the hydrus device, there are times when it can be difficult to place. And I've not found that the extra hassle so to speak, of these procedures is worth it in patients who have severe glaucoma. So I'm either going to do cataract surgery or may, if I'm inclined, I may do cataract surgery combined with an eye stent. The same is true for patients who have normal tension glaucoma. We're doing cataract surgery. The pressure is already controlled. I will either do cataract surgery alone or cataract surgery with an eye stent. So how about the other patient population? These are patients where our primary indication for surgery is to lower intraocular pressure their pressure is uncontrolled. I decide which procedure to do for these patients based on the severity of the glaucoma and where it is that I want the pressure to end up. So if my pressure target is low teens, a patient with advanced glaucoma, then I'm either gonna do a trabeculectomy or a tube surgery, or perhaps we can do a Zen device. If the pressure target is mid-teens or higher, let's say my goal is mid-teens or high-teens, or I just want to get the pressure down into the low 20s, or if the patient has pseudo-exfoliation or pigmentary glaucoma, where the primary pathology is at the trabecular meshwork, then I would consider an angle-based procedure, such as the KDB goniotomy, or more recently I've started doing viscocanaloplasty combined with the goniotomy, or in these patients, we can also do cataract surgery combined with the hydrus device. The hydrus device is not indicated for standalone use as of yet. So if we want to take advantage of the hydrus device, it has to be done in combination with cataract surgery. So if a patient is undergoing surgery to lower intraocular pressure and they also have a cataract and we want to get pressure in the mid-teens or high-teens, then I would, I would consider cataract surgery combined with the hydrus device. So in summary, which procedure is best for my patient? Well, it depends on why it is we're doing surgery in the first place. Stop and think. Is the primary goal of surgery to improve vision? Are we doing the surgery for cataract removal? Or are we doing surgery to lower intraocular pressure? And your choice of procedure will depend on the indication for surgery. Thank you. Uh, if you need to, if you would like to ask any questions, you can reach me via email uh, or on social media. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Almala. Our last talk of the session is uh, from uh, Drs. Vajranant and Dr. Henry. Uh, the topic of the talk is new drainage device. Where does clear path fit in? Good morning. This is an exciting time for surgical management of glaucoma, as now we have many options. In this presentation, I will discuss a new glaucoma drainage implant clear path. I do not have any conflict of interest. Recent innovation allow us to target treatment by different mechanisms, including improving trabecular outflow, accessing subocular space, 
reducing aqueous production by lasers, and to uh, bypass aqueous humor from entered chamber to subconjunctival space. Although minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries or MIGs has gained popularities due to safety profiles, the conventional filtering surgeries such as trabeculectomy and tube shunt surgery remain an important and reliable means to achieve a lower target pressure. To decide whether uh, ClearPath fits into our current practice pattern, we will review unmet needs in surgical management, how ClearPath compared to others device and our experience at UIC. Dr. Steve Getty discussed three unmet needs in surgical glaucoma management. First is the safety efficacy trade-off. We need a procedure that offer efficacy of trap and tube with safety profile of mix. Second, a need for a treatable glaucoma procedure. Patients respond differently uh, to the same glaucoma procedure because they have different healing responses. An ability to selectively increase or decrease aqueous filtration based on the post-op pressure level would be very beneficial feature of uh, a glaucoma procedure. And last is the cost. We need to minimize the cost of the procedure and also the cost of post-operative care. The two commonly used and commonly studied uh, glaucoma drainage devices are AMID FP7 and valve 350. Uh, AMID has a valve function, is a folded elastic membrane that opens at a certain pressure level. Valve, um, on the other hand, is a non-valve uh, implant, so we ligate the device when used. And the other different feature is the size. Uh, AMID fits between the two rectus muscles and valve that we need to place it underneath the muscles. In practice, I consider four factors when selecting implants if an immediate pressure control or if I anticipate hypersecution or hypotonym, I choose uh, Ahmed. I choose Ahmed or Bevelt 250 for a smaller orbit. Uh, in general, a larger implant such as Bevelt 350 achieves a lower target pressure. Now let's review our evidence regarding safety and efficacy. The best evidence would be a pooled data analysis from two largest randomized trials, ABC and AVB. The pool data of 514 eyes showed that the valve group had a lower failure rate, lower rate of de novo glaucoma surgery, and lower means IOP on fewer medications than AMID. However, Bavelt carried a higher risk of hypotonia complications. Ahmed clear path come with two sizes, 250 and 350. The implants uh, came preloaded with four or proline drip cord. Unlike others, clear path 250 is a true single quadrant device that fit between the muscles, eliminating the need to isolate them. To date, there's no published data on safety and efficacy. I will present data from two posters at this year 2021 American Glaucoma Society meeting. This is a large and multi-center retrospective analysis of clinical outcome of Ahmed Klepas um, that presented by Dr. Davender. The study is sponsored by Newer Medical. This is a mix of 250 and 350, majority is 250. At a six month, the mean IOP was 13.7 compared to pre-op of 26.3. Uh, complication includes self-limited hyphema and hypotony uh, rate at a 7%. The other study is from investigators from the Wills Eyes Hospital. This is a smaller series um, here uh, comparing the four devices. 350, 250 uh, Bevelt, and a 250 and 350 clear path at six months show mean IOP lower in clear path group, in fact, uh, a lower uh, but a higher rate of hypotony and no difference in terms of IOP reduction based on sizes. Our experience at UIC, we started implanting clear path last summer and we'll be analyzing our data once we have it adequate uh, follow-up time. This year was a pleasure um, working with uh, our glaucoma fellow, Dr. Michael Henry, one of the best surgeons I uh, ever worked with. 
Um, here is his video showing a small incision on it, ClearPath 250. This technique was originally developed by Dr. Paul Singh. Show here is um, Dr. Henry opened the conjunctiva four millimeter from the limbus and also four millimeter in length, then a dissecting, undermining conjunctiva make a, a good relaxing pocket. Then as you can see, he's cauterized. Um, then with the clear path, the plate is, is quite flexible so you can actually fold uh, the device like taco and then insert it into this small uh, incision. Then we proceed as like other uh, implant. This slide shows blood profiles from four different devices, Ahmed, Belvelt 350, Ahmed Clear Path 250 and 350. All of these eyes have very comparable pressure of a single digit or low teen. You can see the low lying showing uh, from the uh, clear path compared to others. This is the uh, clear path 250 and 350 from two eyes from one uh, same patient showing a low pressure, low profile of the blood and with the um, diffuse a pocket of fluid around the blood or the device um, showing on the ultrasound. The bottom line is the safety efficacy trade off the clear path. Uh, 250 had comparable uh, pressure or deduction and uh, safety compared to other devices and also other uh, and also clear pass 350. Hypotony, I see that as opportunity to achieve a lower target pressure and in terms of the need for a tradable glaucoma procedure, uh, it, this device came with a rip cord and you can also use this rip cord technique for the bell valve. The cost is comparable among these four devices. Take home is that based on existing data and our experience at the infirmary, the clear path 250 is an attractive option because easy to use, easy to implant with a comparable and low pressure um, compared to others, no need to isolate um, muscles and low blood profile that likely less disturb the muscles and lip precision and also ability to implant it in the, through the small incision. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vajaranth and Dr. Henry for that excellent talk. And now I would like to invite the panel members, Dr. Basian, Dr. Arav, Dr. Almala, and Dr. Sood uh, to join us. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, type those into the chat box. Thank you. So I have a question for Dr. Henry. So uh, with the Duresta, what do you think uh, will be the, um, right now the device I think is approved for a single use. And uh, what do you think would happen in the future in terms of uh, it being allowed for multiple uses and what would be the interval between the injections? Well, Dr. Raff or Dr. Henry? Go ahead, Dr. Ruff, whatever you think. Um, you know, it, it, it's tricky. It's, uh, you know, the labeling, I think for the, F the FDA labeling for the device, I think is a little disappointing. You know, uh, when the device was under investigation, we were all imagining and hoping for a replacement to topical therapy, which, you know, for most patients with chronic disease is not gonna be the case uh, because of the endothelial cell loss issue. Uh, we've dealt with this before with the Cypass. You know, for both of these issues, the Cypass and the Darista, what I'm hoping to see is not a scenario where everything is painted with the same brush, but rather that the practitioner can use their own judgment in terms of risk benefit profile for an individual patient. You know, a patient with a deep AC who's pseudophagic with he healthy endothelium is going to be much different than a patient with chronic angle closure. Uh, who's phakic and whom the risk for corneal decompensation will be higher. So, um, you know, I think at this point we can still exercise our judgment, uh, but repeat injections will be off label, of course, and um, there are, um, you know, payment issues related to that as well. Thank you. 
So there are uh, two questions in the chat box. Uh, first from Dr. Uh, Mohan, and uh, the question is uh, that in your own practices, what is the ratio of tobacolectomy versus tubes that you're electing to perform in your adult patients with open angle glaucoma? Anybody want to take that? Uh, I would actually say, so I'm uh, tending to do more tubes than uh, traps, but I'd advocate for um, the ab interno zen. I've really enjoyed good success with the ab interno approach. Um, I've also started using Marlene Moster's technique of um, marking the Zen before inserting it. And that allows great visualization. Uh, I tend to have a lower threshold now for doing a combined phaco Zen on my patients because I have quite a few one week out. I'm almost, the post-operative care is very similar to my phacos in some cases where I'm seeing them one day, one week, and then I'm seeing them you know, two weeks later. Um, it, it, and it looks like a really nice lab. I increased the amount of mitomycin C that I'd previously been using. And uh, so if anything, I'm actually migrating to doing more phaco zens than um, even phaco traps at this point. Thank you. We have another question from Dr. Joel Sugar on how mobile is the durista in the anterior chamber? Dr. Raff or anybody else who has yeah, I, been I, using I'll, it? Oh, go ahead, Mohammed. Hi, hi. Um, the Drista is very mobile in the anterior chamber. Uh, you know, I, I think for the most part, you know, the ones I've seen, you know, whenever you see the patient in the slit lamp, it's going to be an inferior angle. But having taken some of these patients to um, the operating room afterwards for trabeculectomies, I mean, any kind of fluid movement in the anterior chamber causes them to, uh, to move around. So during a patient's regular activity, I would imagine that, I would imagine that it can be mobile. Um, I don't know how it is when a patient is supine or when they're, they're laying, um, but I've, whenever, anytime you, you're gonna irrigate an anterior chamber, you, you can see the Dorista implant moving around. I don't know, I'm, I'm interested to hear, to hear others' experience as well. You know, I think that's a really interesting question, um, Joel, and thinking that, you know, the more mobile that the implant is, perhaps the more effect on cornea endothelium. When we examine these patients in the clinic, of course, they're all upright. But now you've got me thinking that uh, maybe for a few of these patients, we could have them lay down in the clinic and uh, examine them with direct gonioscopy uh, to see and get a better sense for how mobile the implant is under physiologic conditions. I can imagine them lying on their stomach while sleeping and uh, you know the device floating on the back surface of the cornea instead of massaging the endothelial cells. I mean, you could visualize it that way. Question for Dr. Basin about the Zen and maybe Dr. Almala and others who are using it. Uh, we talked about the difficulty in uh, late needling of uh, the Zen. Um, why do you think late needling is not a option like it is for you know, regular tobacolectomy? Uh, thanks, Dr. Ivor, for the question. In, in our experience of the few people that we have needled, we found that the visualization of the Zen is a really important aspect of being successful. And while you know, it's different from Shalini's experience. Uh, while we are sort of babysitting the robust kind of uh, scarring process that occurs after the Zen has been implanted, we are losing the visualization and more scar tissue is being laid down. And so then the ability to go above and below the Zen and see exactly what you're doing is limited then by perhaps our patient population as well, being African-American predominantly. But um, we don't really have a good sense of where we are in that quadrant a lot of the time. And so it seems more blind than with trabeculectomy. I, I haven't been doing um, a lot of late lead needlings. Um, actually, again, it's, as I've increased the amount of mitomycin C that I'm injecting, 40 to 60 micrograms, I've had to do a lot less needling than I was initially when I was using the Zen. Um, I also do kind of like a mini needling right at the end. So after I've inserted the Zen, um, at the end, I'll go in with my, my needle injecting the MMC and then going above and below the Zen 
right there um, interoperatively. And um, like I said, because I can visualize it really well with the marking now, um, I can see it and, and feel really comfortable doing that. Well, thank you all for your comments and for your insight. Uh, it was a great session and I'll uh, move the session back to Dr. Vajranant to uh, introduce our keynote speakers. Thank you again. Thank you very much for the uh, excellent first session. Um, hopefully we can continue to answer some of the questions that are coming through in the chat box. Thank you all. So next will be our first name lecture, uh, the Walensky lecture. So Dr. Walensky himself will introduce uh, our keynote speaker today. Hello. Uh it is um, my pleasure to uh, have the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Joshua Stein, who will be delivering the uh, Walensky Lecture this morning. Um, the Walensky Lecture was started when a number of my former fellows, residents, and patients made contributions to uh, create the Walensky Endowment, which was to help uh, support some of the uh, activities of the glaucoma surface uh, here at the U of I. Um, and we have used uh, the income from that uh, fund to help uh, support uh, our annual uh, glaucoma symposium uh, here in the department every year. Um, I'm particularly uh, happy to have Dr. Stein uh, giving this lecture today, since uh, he is, as you will hear, is going to be talking about uh, data. Uh, one of the first projects that I worked on when I came here involved uh, data uh, that was computerized uh, and led to one of my first papers uh, uh, here in the department. Um, Dr. Stein uh, received his medical degree from uh, Jefferson Medical College. He did his residency in ophthalmology at NYU and then did his glaucoma fellowship at Duke University. Uh, he did graduate work and made evaluative clinical science at Dartmouth Medical School, uh, where he received a master's degree. Uh, he later did additional graduate studies in healthcare research at the University of Michigan and got a second uh, master's degree. Uh, he then uh, pursued a fellowship in health policy at the University of Michigan. Uh, he is now the Edward T. and Ellen K. Dreyer uh, Career Development Professor in Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center. Um, his clinical interests include the evaluation and management of adults with glaucoma, medical, laser, and surgical treatment of patients with glaucoma, including glaucoma, uh, filtering surgery and uh, glaucoma drainage implant surgery. He also focuses on health services research uh, patterns of eye care in the United States, outcomes of glaucoma surgery, and the quality of life of patients with ocular disorders. His lecture today is the future of big data and ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Stein, we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Thassarat, for such a wonderful introduction and for inviting me to participate in this glaucoma symposium. Before I get started, I just want to say what an incredible honor it is to give a name lecture after Dr. Walensky. If one were to stop and think about it, 
Over the course of his illustrious career, Dr. Walensky played a pivotal role in nearly every medical and surgical intervention for glaucoma that we have in our armatarium. To think about the number of patients whose sight have been preserved from the care Dr. Walensky has provided them, all the residents and fellows who've benefited from working with and learning from him and from his innovative research, we can all aspire to have such an impactful career as Dr. Walensky has had. And I'm very grateful to give a talk in his honor. For this talk, I have no financial disclosures. It's an exciting time in healthcare and ophthalmology. There are several key puzzle pieces that are coming together to really enable researchers to take advantage of big data. The first key puzzle piece to permit us to take advantage of big data is digitization of personal data. Whether it's the transition from paper to electronic health records, the proliferation of all these cool smart technologies that help us uh, keep track of the temperature we like to set our thermostat to or the types of music we like to listen to or all these apps that let us keep track of our likes and dislikes or watches like Fitbits that measure our physical activity or sophisticated tools like OCT that can capture in exquisite detail the structures in the front or the back of our eye to sophisticated techniques that permit us to sequence the entire human genome of all of our patients. The second key puzzle piece is the advances in computing power. With all this data that we're capturing, we need to be able to process it. In 2015, there were computers that could surpass the brain power of a mouse. By 2023, we'll have computers that will surpass the brain power of a human. And in many of our lifetimes, we'll have computers that are equivalent to all human brains combined. Something really scary. The third key puzzle piece is advances in data storage. In the 1980s, it cost $100,000 to store a gigabyte of data, and now it costs just a few cents to store all this data we're capturing. And then finally, there are lots of folks who are really experienced and know how to work with this data, whether it's to use it for telemedicine, for disease management, for data analytics, genetics research, drug discovery, and all, so all sorts of other areas. There are also some challenges associated with working with big data. The first is information overload. The amount of data generated in two days is as much as all data generated in all the human history before the year 2003. And with all this data that's out there, how do we know what to do with it? What data is important and what data is not? Or how do we distinguish the signal from the noise? Another issue with big data is big data is messy. It's estimated 80% of world's healthcare data is unstructured. By unstructured, I mean in free text format. And while one could simply choose to ignore these paragraphs and paragraphs of data that we see in free text format, there's really a lot of useful information. And the challenge for us as researchers is to figure out ways to sophisticated, sophisticated ways to grab the key information. And that requires using tools like natural language processing to find the key details from this free text. There are also additional challenges. For example, the location of all this data is stored in different places. The data can be stored in different formats. Some are in JPEG, some are as DOC documents, some are as HTML and we really need data to be in similar formats to be able to integrate it into some of our algorithms. There are issues with def different definitions for different fields of data we're trying to capture. Issues with the structure of the data, the complexity of the data, and then certainly issues related to regulations and requirements, being able to share the data in ways that are secure and HIPAA compliant. There are also challenges for those of us who are clinicians. There's just simply not enough hours in the day for us to process all the data that's out there. 
It's estimated that less than five hours a month are spent by clinicians reading medical journals, yet researchers have estimated it takes 21.7 hours a day to keep up with all the patient care guidelines. And for those of us who value sleep, that's just not physically possible. There are over 30,000 active clinical trials and over 23 million articles in PubMed. How do we keep track of all the information that we're uh, gathering on our patients? Another issue with big data is that one can come up with these sophisticated algorithms using AI or machine learning to crunch numbers and to come up with insights. But if that data, if that those insights are stuck on a computer in a basement lab and not readily available to clinicians to help at the point of care with decision making, it really limits their use utility. Finally, we need to keep in mind that the clinical information captured in our electronic health records is really just a small fraction of what's going on with a patient and all the factors that may affect their health. One needs to really expand and consider genomic factors, environmental factors, social determinants of health, the environment where one lives in. All these factors really gives us a better sense of the factors affecting the health of our patients. So the way I see things, it's really a universe of big data. And the challenge is that we've got all this cool data that's coming from all these different sources. But the problem is, is that all the data is very siloed. And what we need to do is figure out how to link those silos together so we can get a full appreciation or a holistic view of what's going on with our patients. So let's now talk about integrating big data into ophthalmology. Rather than trying to tackle the entire universe of big data, let's hone in and focus in on, say, a galaxy of ophthalmology data. And the key question is, is it possible to link the clinical data in our electronic health records with lab data, visual field data, medication data, data from our OCT devices, claims data, radiology and pathology data? And if we can achieve that, that in and of itself would be a big feat. So I'm pleased to tell you about the Site Outcomes Research Collaborative, or SOURCE Ophthalmology Electronic Health Record Repository. SOURCE is a consortium of academic ophthalmology departments, all of whom are on the EPIC Electronic Health Record, that are working together and contributing data on patients with ocular diseases seen at their institutions. We've tapped into the back end of EPIC and have methodically figured out ways to grab all the relevant data that could be useful for research and quality improvement, including patient demographics, structured data from clinic visits like visual acuity and eye pressures, billing and administrative data, Patient report outcome data, that's something that uh, we routinely collect on our patients at Michigan. Pathology result data, lab test data, data from operative reports and medications. After it took quite a while for us to figure out how to grab all that data, we figured, wouldn't it be great if others who are other academic sites who are also on EPIC could take our extraction code and extract their data in the exact same format as we are. And we've been sharing our code with various other sites and working with them to pull their data. We have this software that's able to remove all the protected health information. The data can be safely and securely sent to the, the data hub at the University of Michigan where it gets clean, harmonized, linked up with ocular imaging and diagnostic test data, perhaps in the future get linked up to genomic data, and then the pool of aggregate data made readily available to researchers at any site that's contributing their data to use for research and quality improvement projects. There are presently more than two dozen academic centers throughout the country that are at different stages of joining SOURCE. I'm pleased to report that UIC is one of the institutions that we're working with, so hopefully you guys will soon be able to take advantage of this resource. 
and the following sites have completed all the data sharing paperwork and are actively sending data into the consortium. Here's an example of some of the data that we're able to capture. For your standard eye exam, for every structured data field, one is able to capture all the different pathology that's present. In this case, for the optic disc, we're able to look at the text associated with all the clinic notes and parse out all the pathology of interest. In terms of surgical data, we have information on the type of anesthesia, eye laterality, the location where the surgery took place, how long the surgery took, preoperative and postoperative diagnoses, up to five CPT codes per surgery, all the implants and supplies used, medications, as well as information from operative reports. In terms of medications, anything that one would put on the standard outpatient prescription is capturable in the data set. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, it's possible to grab all the metadata from the ocular diagnostic tests, whether it's biometry, OCT, visual fields. At present, we have almost 1.5 million unique eye care recipients throughout the various health systems, over about 7 million office visits for eye-related problems, about 150,000 ocular surgeries, 173 million lab test results, 28 million medication orders, 573,000 macular OCTs, 77,000 nerve fiber layer OCTs, and about 170,000 visual fields in the, in the repository. Researchers can tap into this source and use it for all sorts of different purposes spanning the gamut from clinical studies to outcomes research to machine learning uh, modeling to disparities and inequities in eye care to quality improvement initiatives to identifying patients for recruitment for clinical trials, to name a few. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk highlighting three studies that my colleagues and I have used source data for. The first of these is tapping into source for what I call enhanced phenotype identification. If you think about it, for researchers to really take advantage of big data, it's really important to accurately identify and classify diseases or phenotypes of interest. When, while, while one would think that this should be easy, if you think about how researchers, myself included, have tapped into this, whether it's using claims data, iris registry data, we're always relying exclusively on ICD-9 and ICD-10 billing codes to identify diseases of interest. And while the use of billing codes has certainly been helpful in identifying conditions of interest, there are issues. For example, some ocular conditions just simply lack billing codes. There are issues with miscoding, upcoding, downcoding, insufficient coding. And then in 2015, when there was a transition from the use of ICD-9 to ICD-10 codes, there was an explosion of codes from 14,000 to almost 70,000 codes. I kid you not, here are some conditions that show up in the code book. So I'm not sure if you guys routinely care for patients with these conditions, but clearly Someone who is creating these codes figure that it's important to capture patients getting sucked into jet engines or patients who are pecked by chickens. Even if one were to focus on a more common condition like diabetic retinopathy, if one tries to code that properly, if you look in the code book, there's actually 18 separate codes for this one condition alone. And as a glaucoma specialist, if I'm trying to take care of a patient with this condition, I'm not dilating them, the chances that I'm going to get the right code is about 1 in 18. So while there are clearly advantages of using ICD-10 codes over ICD-9 codes in terms of better capture of bilaterality, more granular capture of certain diseases, assuming they're coded properly, and documentation of disease severity for selected conditions, 
I believe we really need to move beyond billing codes if we really want to take advantage of this big data. So here I'm going to present a novel approach that researchers can use to identify ocular conditions of interest using electronic health record data. This is a glaucoma conference. I want to focus on a condition that's near and dear to many of us, exfoliation or pseudoexfoliation syndrome, the most common secondary type of open angle glaucoma. We're all familiar with this condition and it has these characteristic findings on slit lamp exam. If one looks to see how other researchers have tried to identify patients with this condition using big data sets like claims data, this is a study my colleagues and I published a few years ago. You could see all we were able to do were look at the billing codes. So with electronic health records, we can certainly continue to look at billing codes. For every condition and every patient we see, it's impossible, at least at my institution, to close the chart without selecting at least one billing code for a given encounter. A second area one can look is in the patient's problem list. This is a running list of all the different conditions that a patient has had during their time in the health system. A third area is in the quote unquote smart data fields. And for this particular condition, the parts of the eye exam that are most relevant are the iris and lens exam. And then finally, one can look throughout all the other areas or the, of the free text or the unstructured data, in this case, in the assessment and plan or maybe the HPI section for evidence of the condition. Now, it gets a little tricky when it gets to the unstructured data because one can document this condition many different ways. So you, we have to rely on tools like natural language processing. So with natural language processing or text parsing, one can search all the different areas of a clinic note and look for the different ways people can document this condition. For this particular condition, we identified 14 different ways that our colleagues documented this in the clinical exam. But we need to be sophisticated and not just look for mentions of the condition. We don't want to capture negative mentions like no record of the condition or if it's being mentioned about a different type of patient like exfoliation perhaps in burn patients or statements like family history of the condition when the patient themselves don't, doesn't have the condition. So we put together this list of all the different areas in the electronic health record where one could try to get information on whether a patient has a condition. And our question was, which of these parameters or groups of parameters best predict which patients actually have exfoliation syndrome? I then recruited four of my colleagues who are all glaucoma specialists and asked each expert to review 50 randomly assigned charts, some with and without the condition, to come up with a gold standard of which charts represent patients with the condition. We then used this method called lasso regression where our dependent variable was definite evidence of the condition as judged by our experts. We put all these independent variables into our model and we found these five areas best predicted who had actually had exfoliation syndrome. Percent of visits where it was documented in the iris exam, the lens exam, tr iris transillumination defects, the problem list, and the natural and the free text. Interestingly, the billing codes were not the most important factor. This model, we were able to apply it to all the patients at the time we did this, there were 122,000, and gave each patient a score from zero to 100% of their likelihood that they had the condition. Not surprisingly, most patients had very, have very low probability, but we could identify 353 patients with a 90% probability and 83 with a greater than 99% predicted probability. We then went back to the glaucoma specialists and validated our algorithm and found it had a positive predictive value of 95.5% and a negative predictive value of 100%. So it seems like it's working very well, at least in our population. Interestingly, when there was billing code documentation of exfoliation syndrome, about 90% of the time, it was also showing up in the smart data or in the free text. But the converse wasn't true. When there was free text, 
or smart data evidence as a condition, only about 20 to 40 percent of the time did the provider bill for it. So one can apply this enhanced phenotype classification for all sorts of different ocular diseases. Imagine how easy it would be to recruit patients for enrollment in clinical studies and clinical trials if everyone had a score from zero to 100 percent. One wouldn't need to start going through charts or having residents or trainees or staff looking for patients when every patient would just have a score. For those interested in learning more about our enhanced phenotype identification algorithm, we published this paper in JAMA Ophthalmology a year or so ago. The second example I want to give is the research that's the focus of my current R01. That's taking information from resources like Source and using a technique called Kalman filtering to generate personalized, real-time, dynamically updated forecasts of glaucoma and personalized target IOP menus. So what is Kalman filtering? It's a forecasting and noise reduction technique that's useful for modeling complex large systems. It was used by NASA to fly Apollo up to the moon and it's routinely used in commercial aviation. And researchers have been using it in other areas of medicine, including glaucoma care. It combines a population-based understanding of disease evolution with individual patient characteristics to forecast future values of key clinical parameters. So how do Kalman filters work? Well, picture we want, we have a spaceship and we want to get from the Earth up to the moon. What are some factors affecting the future locations of the spaceship? We could look at prior flights using similar spaceships, earlier coordinates from the same spaceship, and the more past observations, the better our predictions, information like the type of spaceship, the wind speed, and measurement error. So if we were to apply this analogy to glaucoma, we've got a patient's baseline level of, say, mean deviation, pattern standard deviation, and intraocular pressure. We want to know what their, these values are going to be five years into the future. Well, prior flights from similar spaceships are akin to glaucoma progression dynamics from similar patients, such as those in, in clinical trials like Aegis, Sigits, Oats. Earlier coordinates from the same spaceship are past measurements from that patient. The type of spaceship includes characteristics like the patient's age, sex, race, genetic predisposition, wind speed is like patient adherence, and measurement errors are variability in measuring these various parameters of a patient in the SIGIT study. The first few visits, the Kalman filter learns how that patient's behaving. We also, it also has a population information from all the other patients in that trial. And here you can see the red X predicts where that patient's mean deviation will be at the next point in time. And then it uses the next set of measurements to predict the next red X, etc. Here the blue triangles are predicting what's going to happen over the next several years for that particular patient. And you can see how the red X's and blue triangles seem to nicely align with the actual values for this patient. Here's another patient. This is a patient, patient from Aegis who is actually getting worse over time. And again, you could see the red X's and blue triangles seem to nicely align with the observed values for this patient. Here we're using the first several visits to learn how the patient's behaving, and then we're saying at 0.5, what if the patient's pressure is 24 or 18 or 15 or 9 for the next several years? What's going to happen to their mean deviation? Here you can see for this particular patient, if their pressure got very low, we could preserve vision, but if their pressure was 18, 21, or 24, they essentially went blind. By comparison, here's a different patient from the study. For this patient, whether the pressure is 6 or 15 or 24, the amount of loss of mean deviation over the next several years is pretty comparable. So one can think about these uh, target intraocular pressures when deciding how aggressive to treat specific patients. The third and final area I'd like to talk about is applying predictive analytics to ophthalmology. For those in the audience who are baseball aficionados, you may be familiar with the movie Moneyball. It's about the o Oakland Athletics, who in the year 2002 had the third lowest payroll, yet they outperformed nearly every team and almost won the World Series. How did they do it? They used what's called sabermetrics. 
So while other managers were basing their decisions on common metrics like runs batted in, stolen bases, and wins, the A's want dug deeper into the raw data to find better metrics to judge values of players, when to play them in a game, etc. So here's an example of predictive analytics in Major League Baseball. This is a hitter, Bryce Harper, and one could use these predictive analytics and look by season against left-handed pitchers, all these different parameters, and it can plot out exactly where he likes to hit the ball. And as an opposing manager, one could say, hey, he likes to hit the ball to the right side. I may adjust my defense accordingly. Here's another example. This is a pitcher, Clayton Kershaw, and you can see one can stratify by season, by game type, against left or right-handed batters, how many men on base, etc. So the question that I had is if professional sports teams could take advantage of sabermetrics and other predictive analytics, why can't we use these same techniques in medicine and ophthalmology? So here's an example of predictive analytics dashboard for source. We're looking at reduction in intraocular pressure after laser trabeculoplasty. You've got the pre-op and the post-op IOP, and every dot represents a particular patient. One can stratify by preoperative diagnosis, by how much of the angle treated, who did the treatment, patient race, etc. Wouldn't it be awesome if you can pull up on your epic screen and show, hey, I've got a 63-year-old white male with exfoliation glaucoma that I'm thinking about recommending laser trabeculoplasty and pull up all the dots of patients who've undergone that procedure who had the similar profile to be able to show to him his chances of having a very good outcome or a less successful outcome. Likewise, from a research standpoint, one could say, what is the difference between all the patients in A who did so well from the laser versus those in B who really had no reduction or an increase in their IOP after the laser? In conclusion, digitization of personal data and advances in data linking, computer power, storage, and data analytics have really made it easier to take advantage of big data and ophthalmology. Repositories like Source will provide researchers with access to much more granular clinical data than ever before so we can use it for research and quality improvement projects. Linking the electronic health record data with data from other sources will open the door for all sorts of exciting analyses. I believe collaboration across sites is key. There are definitely strength in numbers, especially with these machine learning and other AI site types of studies. And we need to develop analytic approaches that are patient-centric, that facilitate shared decision-making, and can easily be integrated into our clinical practice settings. I'd like to take a second to recognize and acknowledge my colleagues at our Center for Eye Policy and Innovation as well as the generous funding support to help carry out this research. Finally, thank you again for inviting me to speak today and I welcome any questions you may have. I thank you so much, Josh, for such a wonderful presentation and sharing your insights. Uh, on behalf of the glaucoma service, we would like to uh, thank you uh, for this wonderful lecture. And I uh, thank you also for all you do. This is very ex exciting and we really excited to also for the opportunity to join Source. And uh, I like, if it, this is in person, we will be, you know, giving you, presenting you with a plaque. So I have Dr. Walensky here. If Dr. Walensky would like to give any of the remarks and then we're gonna go with a question. I've enjoyed this presentation. It's stimulated all sorts of thoughts. I don't know that I'm gonna be around long enough to do much with it, but I think the future is very bright. Thank you. Yes. And thank, thanks so much again for having me. And, and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, a great, it's a great symposium so far. And I, I look forward to questions that, that you or the audience have. So we, we have one question from our invited speaker as well, uh, Dr. Yao Lu uh, from uh, UW. She said, great talk. And is there any role for training 
ophthalmologists to write their notes so that it's make it easier uh, for you know your um, program to analyze? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. I mean, I think that you know many of us in clinic, you know, are seeing 40, 60 more patients a day. And, um, you know, probably the last thing we have on our mind is how are we going to write a note in a way that a researcher is going to take advantage of it. Um, so I think the challenge for us as researchers is to be able to gather the key information from the notes, no matter how they're written. Um, you know, I think when we put our clinic hats on and are seeing patients, our goal is to focus on providing the best clinical care. And, you know, we need to document the care that we're giving. Um, but, you know, while it would be great from a research standpoint, if everything was nicely, you know, notated in different boxes, uh, capturing all the different clinical details, uh, realistically, you know, unless it's a clinical trial setting where you're very methodically trying to capture all that sort of information, um, it would be very difficult to implement that in clinical practice and get clinician buy-in to, to do it on a regular basis. So thank you. I don't see any other questions. I was just curious about, you know, the model, if you plan to include any social determinant of health or appearance into this analysis? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, in our electronic health records, we do capture information on race, ethnicity, obviously, uh, um, you know, those are um, reported, you know, those are captured at, at the, um, at the health system level and, and, you know, whether they are reflecting what the patient feels would be the most appropriate designation. Um, I think there are some potential issues with that. Um, but we also are able to capture information about the community where the patient lives in and the affluence level. Um, you know, there, those are some examples of uh, social determinants of health, um, but it clearly is important you know, I think I showed that slide where the clinical factors is about 10% of, you know, what affects the overall health of our patients. So getting information on environmental factors and um, other factors um, will become more and more important. And I think as we get better and better at linking data, we'll be able to do that. Thank you. And, um... Hope, hope that you can help answer some of the questions too in the chat box. So we, we will go into the break. But before we're doing that, I, I hope I can invite Dr. Araf and Dr. Deepak Edward um, so that we can spotlight you here for the picture with Dr. Stein. Okay, maybe Dr. Okay, one for Dr. Henry, Dr. Abbasian. So thank you very much again. So everyone smile for the pictures. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. And the next one will be a 10 minutes break and hope we can also continue our conversation in the chat box. Dr. Stein and someone asked for your email address as well. So I think they would like to reach out to you. So welcome back. This is our uh, session to Novo Diagnostics. This session will be led by Dr. Ahmad Ref. He's our Vice Chair for um, Clinical Affairs and also Director of Glaucoma Fellowship. Good morning, Ahmad. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. Um, uh, thank you, Tasrat, for all the work that you've put into this, you and Peter Moon. Uh, it's a lot of work behind the scenes, and thank you. I think everything's going great so far. Um, this will be a great session, I think, on novel diagnostics. Uh, I'll be giving the first talk on uh, new developments in glaucoma imaging, uh, and we can go ahead and show the video. 
Well, thank you very much for attending this session at the annual Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary Glaucoma Symposium. Uh, my presentation is titled New Developments in Glaucoma Imaging. Uh, these are my disclosures, which are not related to any of the subject matter in this presentation. Uh, when we think of uh, imaging and specifically OCT parameters for glaucoma diagnosis and monitoring, we typically categorize them into three. The first is optic nerve head parameters. The second and most widely used is the retinal nerve fiber layer parameter. And the third and most novel is the macular parameter. Uh, so in this short presentation, we will uh, cover some of the features and new developments within each of these parameters and how we can use them uh, for glaucoma diagnosis and monitoring. And we'll go ahead and start with the optic nerve head parameter. I think we can all appreciate the limitations of clinical stereoscopic exam of the optic nerve. Um, multiple studies have now shown us that there is poor agreement among practitioners when uh, examining the same optic nerve in terms of uh, assessment of the features of a given optic nerve. Um, and there's even poor agreement among the same, uh, within the same practitioner examining the same optic nerve at different time points. Uh, there has been shown to be wide variation between uh, clinical exam findings and optic disc reading center findings. And these differences are clinically significant in a large proportion of our patients. Novel OCT scanning protocols rely on the capturing and delineation of Brooks membrane opening to more objectively measure optic disc parameters. Uh, Brooks membrane, of course, is a five-layered uh, matrix that resides between the chorio capillaris and retinal pigment epithelium. And uh, an opening within Brooks membrane allows the optic nerve to exit the eye. And so we can use this uh, opening to our benefit and refer to it as an objective demarcation of optic rim border. The Brooks membrane opening minimum rim width parameter, or the BMO MRW parameter, as obtained by the Spectralis OCT, is derived from a protocol that automatically identifies the border of the BMO and then acquires 24 radial B scans that are centered on the optic nerve. The shortest distance from each of these points to the internal limiting membrane is used to calculate the BMO MRW parameter. I think that total BMO area is especially useful when uh, assessing asymmetric disc size, and this information can be easily missed, but is located within the display of the optic nerve SLO image. Uh, this is a patient of mine that has supratemporal thinning of the neuroretinal rim that corresponds to an infranasal visual field defect. And the MRW map on the lower right-hand side shows consistent depression in the supratemporal sector. Distance values as well as percentiles are compared to age-matched controls and are displayed within the map. Stag and Medeiros performed an observational cohort study comparing diagnostic performance between BMO, MRW, and conventional retinal nerve fiber layer parameters. They found that overall, the global retinal nerve fiber layer thickness parameter outperformed global BMO MRW parameter with respect to diagnostic accuracy. Infrotemporal uh, thickness was the highest performing BMO MRW parameter. An important strength of this study is that a diagnosis of preperimetric glaucoma was made on the basis of structural damage, which was detected in a longitudinal manner. The serious HD OCT algorithm for measurement of neuroretinal rim thickness differs from that of the spectralis device. Optic nerve head measurements with this device are derived from a standard cube of optic nerve and peripapillary signal data. And rather than measuring the shortest distance between Brooks membrane opening and the internal limiting membrane, the serious device calculates the smallest cross-sectional area among polygons that are generated from 180 disc margin points to corresponding points on the ILM. These measurements are used to plot neuroretinal rim thickness around the circumference of the optic nerve and also to calculate various other parameters that are displayed in a data table. 
Uh, our second uh, parameter that we'll cover is retinal nerve fiber layer. And uh, of course, with faster scanning rates uh, that are achieved with spectral domain OCT, uh, diagnostic accuracy for the various retinal nerve fiber layer parameters has been shown to be quite high. Studies on devices from different manufacturers are consistent in finding that the superior and inferior sectors and clock hours tend to give us highest diagnostic accuracy. Deviation maps are extracted from thickness maps and are color coded to, to accentuate areas of thinning compared to age match controls. I find these deviation maps very helpful in day-to-day -day clinic to help differentiate retinal nerve fiber layer pattern loss from other causes of signal loss, such as signal artifact or other retinal pathology. Deviation maps uh, from the spectralis device are not yet available in the US, but should be in the near future. The most updated spectralis device software allows the practitioner to choose from three different peripapillary circle scanning diameters. And this can be helpful in cases of peripapillary pathology, such as myelinated nerve fiber layer. It is important to remember that although measurements among our various devices correlate strongly, they're not entirely compatible and should not be used interchangeably. Our last parameter that we'll cover is the macular parameter. Uh, since a significant proportion of the retinal ganglion cell population resides in the macula, structural glaucomatous deficit may also be detected and monitored in this region. The Spectralis GMPE posterior pole horizontal protocol is composed of 61 B scans that are centered on the fovea, uh, which correspond to 20 degrees of central visual field. Once this area is scanned, total macular, macular retinal nerve fiber layer, macular retinal ganglion cell layer, and or macular interplexiform layer thicknesses may then be segmented and measured and displayed in an eight by eight grid that contains 65 individual cells for performance of symmetry analyses between eyes and also within the same eye. The Sirius protocol segments the ganglion cell and interplexiform layers and measures the thickness of these two layers within an elliptic annulus centered on the fovea. The area of the annulus is divided into six sections of average thickness data, which is compared to age matched controls. Of the various parameters within uh, GCIPL thickness, it's that minimum GCL IPL thickness parameter that's been shown to have highest sensitivity and specificity. And lastly, it's important to note that as with optic nerve and retinal nerve fiber layer parameters, macular parameters that are measured with the spectralis OCT and serous OCT devices are not interchangeable. Uh, some key points um, regarding this discussion are that OCT derived optic nerve head, retinal nerve fiber layer, and macular parameters all show high levels of diagnostic performance and reproducibility. Use of the BMO has standardized optic nerve head parameter measurement. And enhanced segmentation algorithms allow for isolation of macular layers that are most pertinent to glaucomatous damage. Again, it's important to remember that these measurements cannot be compared across different device manufacturers. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you everyone <clears throat> again for attending. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mohamed Abu Shusha. Uh, Dr. Abu Shusha is currently Associate Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology at the University of Miami Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. Uh, he has secondary appointments in electrical and computer engineering, as well as uh, biomedical engineering. Um, I'm proud to say that I was uh, fellows with Mohammed uh, back in our days uh, in Miami, and uh, Mohammed was a cornea fellow, and I, of course, was a glaucoma uh, fellow. I think over time, Mohammed has realized that uh, research in glaucoma was going to be more exciting, and so that's where he started to focus his efforts. Uh, he'll be giving a very exciting talk today, wearable AI-powered vision diagnostics and augmentation. Uh, Mohammed.
Thank you for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Those are my financial disclosures. Those are patents owned by University of Miami, Bascom Palmer, and licensed exclusively to Hero. So at Bascom Palmer AI and Computer Augmented Vision Lab, we have developed applications that are downloadable on commercially available headsets like Microsoft HoloLens and Magic Leap headset in order to provide diagnostics, visual field, remote eye exam, strabismus measurements, telemedicine, visual distortion, and eye imaging. We have also developed applications to augment patient's vision, AI field of vision expansion, autonomous double vision correction, and visual distortion correction. We know that there is a growing need for care, so there isn't enough providers to care for the population of sick eyes. What we're trying to solve for here is solving the limited access paradigm. And that is through connectivity, portability, reduced skilled practitioners burden, and slash capital equipment cost and expand the point of care. We do that through personalized vision care, artificial intelligence, personalized approachable diagnostics, and customized vision augmentations and all in a wearable device. So wearable diagnostics make a lot of sense. Today, over 8 million visual fields are done annually. There is increasing population worldwide, too many patients and not enough providers. The status quo is inefficient, expensive, and bulky equipment that limits the number of exams per day. What we're developing here is a wearable technology, very small, lightweight devices that provide improved disease management and reduce the cost to payers and optimize patient satisfaction. A platform and a wearable device that the aim of it is to improve the quality of life of patients using vision augmentation and to improve the diagnostics to make it more accurate and enjoyable and more objective in a wearable small device with no capital equipment cost and being portable that can lead to extending the point of care to retail stores, to home. And we use connectivity. Right now, we live in a world where everything is connected. So patients will be connected to the cloud and providers connected to the same cloud with EMR integration, patient portal integration, and efficient workflow. And that will lead to extending the point of care from the specialized clinic to the optometrist to general practitioners to retail stores to testing centers and to the patient home and then closing the loop diagnosis leading to augmentation so the status quo for treatment of very common eye diseases like glaucoma strokes macular degeneration is to prevent further damage what we're trying to do here is to improve patients' quality of life, improve their functionality and their independence. So now I'm going to shift gears to talk about the clinical validations that we have done at Bascom Palmer in order to validate this platform. So we have 590 subjects enrolled in different studies and we did validation for different parts of the platform. So the idea here, the concept is measure, personalize, and augment. So our very first study was trying to assess the value of that device. So we measured, and our device showed that it's equivalent to the Humphrey visual field, and then we personalize and augmenting the vision. So as you can see here, this is the visual field test. And then this is a test image. This is what the patient would be seeing before the remapping. And this is actually what the patient is going to be seeing after remapping. And the patient is able to see more of their environment and be more functional. Same here. So this is a visual field effect of a patient with a stroke. If the patient is looking at this picture here, the patient is not able to see that cup of tea. However, after augmentation, the patient is able to see a more complete picture of what he's trying to look at. 
impact. And we have shown that 78% could identify safety hazards with the D-specs for our glasses that they could not previously. And the next level was a study to assess the efficacy of D-specs to improve mobility of patients with peripheral visual field loss. And we published that in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. So we measure the visual field and personalize vision augmentation by relocating and resizing the video signal to fit within the remaining visual field in real time. And we have evaluated the benefit of that in a dynamic walking simulation. So this is the first step. We measure the visual field using the device. And then we personalize and augment the vision and test that in a walking simulation. We recruited 20 patients and we have shown that 90% of the patients that were included could identify peripheral objects in the test images with our glasses that they could not previously. Then the next level was evaluating a see-through augmented reality digital spectacles for improving the mobility of patients with peripheral visual field effects when tested on a walking track. And we custom built this, those glasses using eye tracker augmented reality headsets connected to a portable computer. This study was published in PLOS One. So again, we measure and then we augment and personalize the vision, we assess the performance of the patients in a standardized walking track. So what we found is that the performance of patients in the walking track, judged by the objective detection score, improved with our glasses with an average improvement rate of about 20%. The initial studies that we have done, we used a geometrical method that would fit what the patient is trying to look at into their intact visual field. But we knew that there is a better way of doing it, which is employing machine learning framework. And this is what we've done, visual field testing, and then the visual field goes to a cloud-hosted AI system that will spit out enhanced personalized vision correction uh, parameters to the HERO application in order to improve patient's vision. We used a generalized regression neural network and we implemented uh, it in the cloud, where as you can see here, this would be the normal vision of a patient, and this is the defective uh, vision of a patient with severe visual field defect. And this is what the AI will spit out in terms of what can we do to this image in real time in order to improve the ability of the patient uh, to function. So we were able to perform training for the AI system using 3,171 grading. And that neural network uh, was able to determine the optimal translation method, similar to an expert in approximately 88% of the cases. So we have automated the process. In another study, we wanted to compare the visual field that we obtain using our application, which is cloud-based AI-powered software application, downloadable on commercially available augmented reality headsets with the Humphrey Field Analyzer. And we recruited 47 eyes, 21 healthy, 26 eyes with patients with glaucoma and neuroophthalmic diseases, and all of them underwent 24-2 uh, testing pathway. So we have shown that there is a strong correlation between hero visual field mean deviation and the Humphrey field analyzer mean deviation, same for the threshold values. And we have shown that it's statistically significantly faster than the hero CETA standard. In another study, we actually compared the visual field measurement using hero software cloud application downloadable on Microsoft HoloLens 2 headset to the Humphrey Visual Field Analyzer. And we recruited 40 eyes, and all patients went um, through a 24-2 testing. And we showed strong correlation again between the Hero Visual Field as an application downloadable on the HoloLens Microsoft headset to the Humphrey Visual Field. And we showed that strong correlation in mean deviation and threshold values with excellent reproducibility. In another study, we actually compared 
the performance of our app downloaded on two different commercially available headsets to the Humphrey visual feed. And we recruited 81 eyes to do the study. And we have again shown strong correlation between hero visual field mean deviation and that of the Humphrey seem at the threshold values with excellent reproducibility. Thank you so much for allowing me to present today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much, Mohammed, for that uh, fascinating presentation. Look forward to your comments in the discussion portion. Next, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Joelle uh, Halleck. Um, Joelle is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. Uh, she is Co-Executive Director of the Artificial Intelligence Ophthalmology uh, Center, and she's Director of the Ophthalmic Data Science uh, Laboratory. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Halleck will be presenting Learning Algorithms for Glaucoma Detection. Joelle, thank you. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank Dr. Wacharanand for organizing this great symposium and inviting me to present. My talk today is titled Learning Algorithms for Glaucoma Detection. I have no related financial disclosures. In this presentation, I will give a brief introduction on the various learning algorithms and AI pipelines that we use for classification, segmentation, and progression. I will then provide applicable examples of our work on glaucoma detection, as well as the importance of applications on data from multiple domains. As you know, AI applications are not new. Neural networks have been around since the 1950s, where early work stirred excitement for thinking machines. Machine learning became prominent in the 1980s, and currently the main reason for this new AI wave is due to the advancements in our computation capabilities, where we are able to implement deep learning methods with promising results. This slide shows the differences between classic machine learning models and deep learning ones. In traditional machine learning systems, images are classified from hand-engineered biomarkers using methods such as regression models, SVM, or random forests. Whereas deep learning models are learning to extract biomarkers and classify directly from inputs. An AI system today can be solely based on deep learning methods or a combination of machine and deep learning algorithms as shown in this slide. A main focus in our laboratory, for example, is the extraction of quantitative imaging biomarkers using hand-engineered methods or deep learning methods. Following extraction, we determine which biomarkers are related to disease prognosis. These prognostic biomarkers are then further integrated with patient metadata, such as demographic, clinical, and genetic if available. We can then apply traditional statistical regression models, machine learning models, or deep learning models for classification or prediction tasks. The following three slides describe AI for classification, segmentation, and progression predictions. Classification learning tasks involve assigning an image to different categories by disease type or disease stage. These tasks are typically used for automated diagnosis, screening, or staging. Successfully automating the detection of glaucoma from non-glaucoma, for example, is a challenging task, and studies have shown promising performances using fundus photos, OCT, and clinical data. In computer science, image segmentation refers to the process of dividing an image into segments or outline groups of pixels that represent a meaningful entity. Automated segmentation methods became popular in retinal imaging in the early 2000s, starting with fundus photos. More recently, deep learning algorithms have shown success in segmenting retinal layers of SD-OCT images. Applying deep learning for glaucoma assessment with OCT, including OCT traditional reports, two-dimensional B scans, and three-dimensional volumetric scans have increasingly raised research interests. Studies have demonstrated that using deep learning for interpreting OCT may be more efficient, accurate, and are showing good performance results for discriminating glaucomatous eyes from normal eyes. Similar to classification scenarios, AI can be applied to predict different attributes, disease progression, or treatment response from longitudinal imaging and clinical data. For example, we can have a system that can be developed to predict the progression from glaucoma suspect to glaucoma using structural and functional features. 
The slide shows example studies investigating the retinal nerve fiber layer features identified by unsupervised machine learning on SDOCT and another study that investigated visual progression. These algorithms may allow for tailored management protocols for patients depending on their risk profile. Each of the learning tasks described have pros and cons. The challenges for segmentation tasks include creating a labeled data set and lack of global visual context information, but we do gain some interpretability when using segmentation. Automated classification tasks suffer from lack of interpretability, but are easier to implement given that labeling is easier. A feasible solution is to formulate problems in multitask settings to exploit the complementary information across both segmentation and classification tasks. That is exactly what we did for one of our projects, where we developed a model for glaucoma detection called InterGD that combined segmentation and classification in one architecture. We designed our network in a way that the prediction module learns to predict glaucoma from the obtained disk and cup maps in the segmentation components. So with the help of enough labeled data for a prediction task, we can address the shortage of labeled data in segmentation and achieve interpretable results. This is the overall architecture of our model. It takes a full from this image as input and infers three main predictions. One, segmentation map of the disc region. Two, segmentation of the cup region. And three, glaucoma detection. So basically we used fundus photos that are segmented and also the entire fundus photo. The segmentation module focuses on localizing the regions of disc and cup, which targets the transparency of the model's solution to the task. The prediction component aims to detect the presence of glaucoma from the whole fundus photo. We employed two public data sets that had cup and disc segmentations and one private data set from our own institution called the Illinois Ophthalmic Database Atlas. We isolated two subsets from our database, one larger than the other, to assess the effect of data size on the segmentation module. Our data sets did not have any segmentation labels. This slide shows our experimental results. We can visualize the predicted segmentation maps of our InterGD model from a random sample. The red contours represent the predicted disk map by our model, and the green contour shows the predicted cup maps. The white regions are the ground truth. As can be seen, the proposed model shows a reasonable accuracy in predicting the cup and disk segmentation maps. The table on the right shows how the performance improves with more data. When using more full fundus photos, the performance of the disk and cup segmentation improved to 96.4 and 90.3, respectively, alleviating the shortage of segmented data. With our InterGD model, we were able to develop a unified framework integrating segmentation and classification tasks, achieve clinical interpretability, alleviate the short shortage of segmented label data, and use full fundus photos. As you know, a great challenge in all AI systems that are being developed is their applicability and translation to clinical settings. Data from real-world clinical settings vary in quality, settings, and machine types, and existing deep learning approaches rely heavily on the availability of standardized data. This is how fundus photos look like in clinical settings. They come from different devices, color schemes, resolution, and focus. Assessment of the generalization capacity of deep learning models in for real-world applications is crucial. In this study, we use transfer learning and self-supervised learning to determine the importance of real-world data for generalizations. We trained with real-world data and then tested on standardized data, and then again, we trained on standardized data and tested on real-world data to observe the performance of our model in multiple scenarios. This is the simple deep learning framework that we used. And this slide shows the result of our experiments. ODA-G is the dataset with multiple domain data depicting what we see in the real world, and ODA-A is the single domain dataset which is standardized. As shown, when we train the model using a multi-domain dataset and evaluate it on a smaller and more unique dataset, we achieve better results than if we only train the model in one small unique dataset and then evaluate on an extremely complex real world dataset. The overall results validate the crucial role of real world data for generalizing to clinical settings. If the network trains on small unique datasets, it fails to generalize to other domains. Hence, we need complex diverse datasets that capture aspects of real-world data to cope with generalizations to other domains, especially in clinical settings. 
To conclude, deep learning is an exciting method that holds great promise for glaucoma detection. Deep learning models have consistently been shown to detect and quantify glaucomatous damage using simple color fundus photographs, opening the potential for low-cost screening tests for the disease. In addition, deep learning has been shown to improve assessment of damage on SDOCT images and visual field data, which could improve the use of these tests in clinical practice. Systems that combine structure and function and time series segmentation are of great interest. It is very important to note that no matter how exciting AI technologies can be, validation is needed with rigorous methodology and particular attention to the different settings where the systems will be applied in practice. This is especially true for a disease such as glaucoma, where no litmus test exists for diagnosis or detection of change over time. I would like to thank Dr. Wacharanand for this great symposium, the leadership of the department and the College of Medicine for their support, and the team at the Artificial Intelligence and Ophthalmology Center and the Ophthalmic Data Science Laboratory. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you again uh, to our speakers, and uh, we can go ahead and get started with the uh, panel discussion. Uh, for the audience members, please feel free to post uh, any questions or comments into the chat box, and we will address as many as we can in the next few minutes. Um, Joelle, I think that was a, a great overview of AI and the work that you're doing, of course, is very exciting. Uh, you touched on uh, training of AI algorithms, and I'm Curious, you know, from a practical standpoint, uh, when looking at developing an AI algorithm, what does the training component uh, look like? What does it consist of uh, practically? So it usually depends on the task at hand. So if you were going to do a um, classification task or a segmentation task or prediction progression, um, segmentation is is it very very valuable because if you train an algorithm, to, you know, teach it where to look. At. And uh, it requires a lot of labeling from uh, physicians, and that's one of the limitations. So, if you were to have a fundus photo or in you know a 2D OCT, and you were to outline the RNFL, so that outline you, you kind of have to teach it where to look at. But once you teach it where to look at, it will be able to make more accurate kind of prediction, and you know what it's looking at. So the interpretability is there, similar with fundus photos. So labeling is a very very important kind of task. It's very um, kind of um, you know, challenging to do given that it's a little time consuming. But we are developing methods in order to do uh, train a model with less amount of data. Um, there's, you know, like, like as I mentioned, the uh, classification via segmentation. And also, um, you know, sometimes there are methods where you put in the entire uh, photo, say it's a fundus photo, but there are back propagation methods like saliency maps where you can look back and see where it looked at. Um, but I think uh, the for training data, the biggest things are the quality of the data, the labeling, and the task at hand. Thank you very much. And, and is the training uh, for an algorithm done over a finite period of time, or is it something that needs to be uh, continuous uh, as the algorithm is used? Absolutely continuous because um, these algorithms have to always learn. So in a new setting, in a new, especially for evaluation and when you want to deploy them for clinical practice, you can train an algorithm to, if it looks at one type of data set, but then you put it in another environment, it may not lead accurate results because it hasn't seen that type of data. Um, similar to self-driving cars. You know, every day I've, those the self-driving cars I've been reading about and they send the car to map out how the world is in case the road changes. So every time also for, for medical imaging, there's a big movement now in order to apply some of the methods that they use in self-driving cars. It's like creating a map of the, you know, retina, creating a map of the optic nerve so that it continues to learn every, every time it's uh, deployed in an environment, it will become more and more accurate. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, Mohammed, uh, your uh, your presentation was was very uh, you know enlightening, and uh, of course with glaucoma, uh, we you know the standard is we tell our patients that uh, you know there's no way to reverse the damage that's been done, uh, but now with your technology, uh, you know there may be ways to uh, artificially kind of improve a patient's uh, field of vision. 
Uh, we do have a question from uh, Dr. Santi uh, in the audience regarding uh, cost uh, of these devices. And uh, maybe you can also comment on some of the regulatory uh, hurdles in approval of these exciting uh, wearable uh, technologies. Uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me to present today. It's just such an honor. And, uh, um, you know, the aim here is democratizing healthcare for us and uh, democratizing healthcare by bringing the cost uh, down and making this affordable for everybody. And um, we have this, uh, you know, vision uh, and we did use commercially available headsets. So, uh, you know, our device is, is actually an application that is downloadable on, on commercially available hardware that is very affordable. And that slashes uh, down the price of, of the device and the capital equipment. So, uh, and allow us to provide this as a very affordable um, subscription model that is comparable to a cell phone uh, subscription. So it is going to be around uh, $180 to $250 per month for the patient. And in some cases, actually, without even having uh, any, any set of fee or upfront fee. And we've been developing this technology at, at Bascom Palmer for the last five years. And then we came to a point where we saw that, you know, there is like really uh, great uh, results that we're getting, very promising. And that is when uh, Bascom Palmer uh, decided to spin out Hero as, as a startup company that is part owned by University of Miami and Bascom Palmer in order to achieve that. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mohammed. Uh, another question here, uh, given the similarities in advanced glaucoma and other optic neuropathies, uh, are current AI algorithms uh, able to differentiate between the two? Um, Joelle, maybe you can comment on that one. Yeah, I think it has to, again, with, with if you have uh, uh, labeled, uh, very well labeled initial data set that you're able to differentiate and segment part of and, and say, this is how an optic neuropathy is, and this is how. We haven't done this task yet. It's something that we got approached with as well to do, differentiate between glaucoma. It is challenging, but uh, I think if, for initially to develop something like that, having a very good labeled data set that says this is how an optic neurofocal glaucoma looks like in advance, and this is how an optic neuropathy does. And then looking at other features, not just the optic nerve, if there are other kind of differentiating features that the physician can segment for us, that would be great. And if, you know, kind of it's challenging, we can, if we have a very good labeled data set, we can develop a deep learning algorithm and use back propagation method to see if it highlights different aspects of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Joelle and Mohammed, for taking the time uh, to join us and educate us uh, today. Um, please, for the audience, feel free to uh, pose more questions in the chat box and we can answer offline. Uh, we'll now turn it over back to uh, Dr. Vajarna. So thank you so much for a great session. Um, and thank you all the speakers and all the questions. So next one, we will be uh, talking about glaucoma practice in COVID era. Definitely been a difficult time for all of us during this pandemic. And it's hard to believe that it's over a year ago that we uh, started doing different things because of the pandemic. During this session, our uh, presenters will share their insights into practice into COVID era. So the first speaker will be Dr. Angel Skenzara. She's our assistant professor of ophthalmology here at the infirmary, director of tele um, ophthalmology service, and also director of contact lens fellowship program. She has done a great job in leading the task force during the, the, the COVID um, when it started. So she will share uh, her insights with us. Thank you. 
Thank you to TASRAT and the rest of the glaucoma service for the opportunity to present today. We've seen some considerable changes in the healthcare system over the last 14 months, from new in-office protocols to significant changes in the use of technology during the pandemic. Telehealth adaptation that was expected to take over a decade occurred at an incredible rate over the last 14 months. And though telehealth was previously well employed in ophthalmology, we've seen many changes to the way we apply the technology. I'd like to briefly review changes made in our department related to in-office protocols, share our experience using a teletriage system for urgent visits, and discuss telehealth policy guidelines. In the first weeks of the pandemic, elective procedures were canceled, clinical productivity was reduced to about 10% of that seen prior to the pandemic, and visits were limited to those considered urgent. Initial in-office safety protocols were created in order to safely see patients requiring urgent care during the shelter-in-place order. A symptom screening was performed over the phone and then again by a medical assistant at a single open entryway into the building. Those patients who screened positive for symptoms over the phone were asked to enter via a side entrance upon arrival and immediately directed into a designated isolation room. Most clinics were consolidated into two physical spaces and early measures in the waiting area included demarcated areas on the floor for social distancing from the check-in counter, installation of plexiglass physical barriers at check-in, and non-porous, easily sanitized non-cloth chairs spaced six feet apart. As most of us experienced this at the same time, uh, protocols were created based on our knowledge of COVID at the time and continue to change with additional knowledge gained during the pandemic. In the following weeks, temperature screening was added for all staff and visitors upon building entry and universal masking policies were implemented as soon as enough PPE was available. To limit exposure, resident staff pools were created. All exams were problem focused and IOP was measured with tonopen unless applination tonometry was required by the provider. Dilated exams were performed at the discretion of the provider and patients were screened and examined in the same room. Exam lanes were disinfected after every encounter and isolation rooms were left unused for one hour to allow for droplets to settle prior to disinfection. Imaging and visual fields early on were limited to those in which the study influenced treatment or diagnostic decisions in real time. And a teletriage system was implemented to limit in-person visits to those that were truly urgent. We began opening up all of our services in May and our clinic capacity increased as workflow continued to improve with new protocols in place. Patients were prioritized based on reports from each individual provider, and we retired the teletriage system in early June as PPE was available, COVID rates declined, and staffing had increased. A teleophthalmology task force was created in our department at the onset of the pandemic to work on ways to use telehealth in providing care to our patients. Our primary focus became creating a teletriage system for patient acute visit requests. As some background, early in the shelter in place and based on experiences from colleagues in other hard hit areas, we are expecting an increase in urgent and emergent visits due to temporary practice closures. We also expected a decrease in staffing in clinic, had limited PPE, and needed to create a system for immediately identifying an isolated COVID-19 positive or symptomatic patients. All patients requesting an acute visit completed a short HIPAA-compliant web-based survey through REDCap. This survey included ocular and surgical history, patient symptoms, referral source, COVID symptoms, history of being immunocompromised, willingness to have a telehealth visit, and patient contact information. A triage resident reviewed the survey and if available, the patient's medical record and determined the urgency of the visit. All patients received a call from the physician with determined level of urgency. And risk assessment measures were adopted to stratify patients into three categories. One, high risk requiring an immediate urgent or emergent in-person visit. Two, medium risk requiring a telehealth or phone visit. And three, low risk, which could be rebooked at a later specified time. Urgent visits were scheduled the same day, and the system was used from April 6th to June 6th when all clinics had reopened. Overall, about 358 patients completed the survey. About half were new patients, two-thirds were self-referred, and unfortunately about 44% had been experiencing symptoms for over a week. Upon review, one-third of acute visit requests were screened out as non-urgent, and these patients were scheduled at a later time. The most common patient reported symptoms included eye pain, photophobia, and vision loss. 
Though most patients were self-referred, those who self-reported new onset lid swelling, diplopia, flashing lights, or droopy eyelids were most often referred by a provider. Patients with symptom onset greater than a week tended to be older than those with symptoms lasting less than a week. Um, a delay in medical care due to the pandemic has been reported across the healthcare system. One academic ophthalmology clinic found that 49% of participants in their tele-ophthalmology visits reported they would have delayed seeking care if not for the availability of telehealth. So interestingly, in almost half of patients in our teletriage system were open to telehealth visits, but less than 2% were determined to be good candidates for telehealth. This differs from cholera, in which 78% indicated they would consider opting for telehealth instead of a clinic visit in the future. Upon medical chart review, about 89% of the patients that were recommended an urgent visit based on their symptoms and history adhered to this visit. There was no significant difference in adherence based on individual characteristics, including gender, race, insurance status, nor new or established patient status. However, 26% of race data was reported as unknown or other. We use the address to append census tract level data from the U.S. American Community Survey and zip code level data from the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office. The data was geocoded to each individual subject via ArcGIS. We found that individuals who did not show for their recommended urgent visit more commonly came from neighborhoods with a greater proportion of Blacks or African Americans, greater unemployment rates, and greater cumulative deaths from COVID-19. After controlling for race and cumulative deaths from COVID-19, unemployment rate continued to be associated with non-adherence to visit. Hopefully, with the distribution of vaccines, we'll continue to see a decline in national unemployment rates, but unfortunately, racial residential segregation intensifies disparities in COVID-19 outcomes directly and indirectly, and much more work must be done in order to reduce these healthcare disparities. So with that, we've seen this incredible increase in research published on the topic of teleophthalmology over the last three years. Since 1986, almost 1,200 articles have been indexed in PubMed on the topic of teleophthalmology. Of that, 45% have been published since 2019, and just 25% were published solely in 2020. This matches what we are seeing with adaptation in many optometry and ophthalmology practices. One example is at the Kellogg Eye Center, where telemedicine use increased from 30.7% before the pandemic to 86.2% of providers after its onset. Those expressing confidence with the technology were more likely to have performed three or more telehealth visits and believe it was underutilized. Four primary domains exist within telehealth, and prior to the pandemic, ophthalmology was most familiar with store and forward, with diabetic retinopathy screening programs growing throughout the country over the last several years. These programs have improved access within primary care settings, streamlined urgent referrals, and demonstrated clinical, public health, and economic benefits. Unfortunately, with primary care physicians moving to telehealth video visits since last March, we had to discontinue our screening program early on. The pandemic has forced an increase in acceptance and use of synchronous visits, particularly the use of video visits with patients presenting from home. And in glaucoma management, telemedicine hybrid models have allowed for a limited time in person for testing, followed by video visits for medication reconciliation, reviewing of test results, and answering patient questions. CMS responded to the COVID-19 pandemic by temporarily broadening access to telehealth services in March of 2020, and many private insurers followed suit. The telehealth visits were expanded to allow new and established patients to receive these video visits from their home, and boundaries on where these visits were accessible were lifted. The goal of this act was to limit high-risk patients from having to travel to a healthcare facility while still being able to provide continuity of care. And this opened an opportunity for millions of patients to have a telehealth visit for the very first time. In December, the physician fee schedule final rule was published, and this categorized coverage into three groups based on when they are due to expire. Group A represents 45% of telehealth services, which have been added permanently by CMS. This is really, really great news for our patients. However, regardless of group, audio-only visit coverage will expire at the end of the public health emergency. Thankfully, common medical codes will continue beyond the pandemic. However, our greatest limitation in ophthalmology telehealth visits is the examination itself. Ophthalmic exams require several components, such as corneal evaluation and dilated fundus examination, which currently cannot be performed solely with a video visit. 
With that said, much research is being done to improve the quality of a telehealth visit in ophthalmology. Video encounters currently provide a very limited eye examination, but can serve as a great resource to consult patients on their care, such as reviewing medication compliance or discussing IOL options prior to cataract surgery. Diabetic retinopathy screening programs have shown great success and will continue to improve health outcomes in underserved communities. And additionally, doctor-to-doctor -doctor consults between emergency departments, primary care physicians, optometrists, and ophthalmologists can really increase access to eye care by reducing the number of visits a patient makes for the management of their eye disease. Investing in technology in other healthcare settings, such as fundus or slit lamp cameras, could help us improve eye care access well beyond the pandemic. Thank you, Angel. That was an excellent presentation and all that you do uh, to, to help us do it during the pandemic and to be able to summarize all of that in one presentation. Thank you. For the next talk, it will be Dr. Yao Lu, uh, my esteemed colleague. She's also our invited speaker from uh, University of Wisconsin. Dr. Yao Lu, she's the director of UW Teleophthalmology Program and assistant professor and also the chair of American Telemedicine Association Ocular Health uh, Special Interest Group. She will be speaking about um, virtual telehealth, health call during the and beyond COVID-19. Thanks for the opportunity to present this talk entitled Virtual Telehealth, House Calls During and Beyond COVID-19. I have no financial disclosures. We'll describe the major increase in virtual care in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impacts on outpatient visits throughout 2020, which has been updated from a previous version of this talk I presented at the American Glaucoma Society meeting. Next, we'll discuss various resources and tips for providing virtual eye care. Finally, we'll end with some of the implications for ocular telehealth beyond COVID-19. As you know, within weeks of the World Health Organization declaring COVID-19 a global pandemic in March 2020, there was a sudden dramatic decline in in-person clinic visits nationwide that was only partially offset by telehealth visits. Ophthalmology was the hardest hit of any specialty in this large national study, with a nearly 80% decline in clinic visits. Equally suddenly, there was a massive increase in telehealth use nearly 30% of all outpatient clinic visits were being provided using telehealth in April 2020. Looking across the entire calendar year, the sharp decline in overall outpatient visits in the spring partially recovered over a period of about three months, but remained persistently below baseline for a typical year. Virtual care is defined as real-time patient and provider interactions using telephone or video-based platforms. At their peak, virtual visit volume was about 12% of the total outpatient visits across all specialties in a typical year. Virtual visits continued to represent between 5 and 10% of all outpatient visits through the end of 2020. The cumulative decline in outpatient visits for ophthalmology was nearly 20%, which was fairly average compared to other specialties. Notably, by the end of 2020, Telemedicine visits in ophthalmology represented a negligible proportion of the total outpatient visits in a typical year. This reflects the significant challenges we face in providing care virtually to our patients due to a variety of factors, including our specialty's reliance on slit lamp exams, as well as testing and imaging technologies that are traditionally office-based. However, given the urgent need to provide virtual care in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the American Academy of Ophthalmology rapidly provided detailed and continuously updated guidance. Michael Bolin put together the eye care pandemic listserv to allow eye care providers nationwide to rapidly share resources and best practices. Our American Telemedicine Association Ocular Telehealth SIG provided a video telehealth tip sheet and also published our first guidelines for telemedicine-based glaucoma care this year. Before getting into the details, I'd like to address a few common misperceptions about virtual eye care. First, virtual eye care is not intended to replicate all aspects of the in-person eye exam. Instead, the goals are to identify if any actionable changes are needed in the patient's care and to provide anxious patients with reassurance that it is reasonable to have their next in-person exam at the agreed upon interval. 
In addition, while some providers worry that older glaucoma patients may not be able to use virtual technology, it's remarkable how many of them have become highly adept with using virtual care during the pandemic. If needed, family, friends, or caregivers can assist. Although it can be daunting to provide care virtually when we haven't received much formal training in this area, many of us have actually been providing telehealth for several years and may not realize it. Anytime you've received an email or text with a photo from a patient, colleague, or family member asking about an eye condition, as in this image of bromonidine allergy, that is practicing telehealth. Anytime you've picked up the phone to triage and reassure a worried patient, that is practicing telehealth. And the same skills we've acquired for providing in-person care are still highly applicable to the virtual care environment. Now let's review some practical tips for providing virtual eye care. Scheduling these appointments either just before or after an in-person clinic can avoid the stress of trying to squeeze in virtual visits while your in-person clinic runs further and further behind. Just before, just before clinic is preferable because it allows you to add on virtual patients into clinic if you identify a potentially urgent problem. Having clinic staff contact the patient just prior to the virtual visit provides an opportunity to check that the patient's technology is working, obtain a brief history of present illness, and update medications as your staff normally do in clinic. The staff member can also check that the lighting is adequate. The patient, staff member, and provider should avoid having a bright lighter window in the background as it puts their face in shadow. The patient should also be counseled to have glasses and reading material or an eye chart available. While checking visual acuity is not required for virtual care, it can be very helpful as vision is still our ultimate vital sign. There are a variety of options for testing visual acuity virtually. The most common option is for the patient to pick up any reading material that is readily at hand. Here's an example from a section of the New York Times with its headlines and text matched to their Stalin equivalents on a near card. Patients can provide you with a quick estimate of their visual acuity by simply showing you which lines they are able to read with near correction. Other options include mailing patients printed in Snellen distance or near eye charts in advance, or to use patients' electronic devices to check vision. Many electronic options allow patients to calibrate the size of the letters on their screen to a standard size object, such as the short edge of a credit card. The anterior segment can be quite challenging to visualize given current limits on camera technology that is widely available to patients in their homes. However, you can ask the patient to bring the camera aperture on their device very close to their eye. Furthermore, you can demonstrate how to do this with your own phone. Sometimes you may need to ask the patient to provide more light using a flashlight or to stand in front of a bathroom mirror where lighting is very bright. Asking the patient to lift their eyelid while looking down also allows for assessment of trabeculectomy blebs and tube shunt coverage. Additional tools to enhance virtual eye care are discussed in another talk within this session. Combining testing at home or in the clinic and can be highly complementary to counseling patients on their test results and advising them on further glaucoma management virtually. In particular, providing hybrid or digitally integrated visits can maximize the quality of the available data using technician-based clinic testing and virtual follow-up with providers. The major expansion of virtual eye care during the pandemic has several implications for the future of ocular telehealth. The easing of restrictions and improved reimbursement have dramatically increased adoption and patient demand for virtual care. There is greater recognition of the significant challenges we face in implementing telehealth, an active area of inquiry in the field of implementation science. A variety of emerging technologies could be game-changing for a broad spectrum of ocular conditions, and glaucoma is no exception. Some of the technologies I'm most excited about involve home-based testing. Some examples include home-based OCT and intraocular pressure devices. While these technologies have great potential, they also come with many challenges that will need to be overcome to integrate them into routine clinical practice. In summary, the COVID-19 pandemic has provided us with an opportunity to better understand and expand the use of telehealth. It has also taught us the value of providing more options to increase patient access to timely care and to recognize that the goals of virtual care are different from those of in-person care. While this has been a challenging time for all of us, it has also spurred significant innovation in broadening the spectrum of high quality services we offer to our patients. On their behalf, we thank you for all that you have done and continue to do during these unprecedented times in person and virtually.
Thank you so much, Yao. Um, I'm really impressed by uh, your talk at the AGS and um, I'm really um, glad that you can uh, share your insight today and thank you also for all that you do. The next speaker is Shalini Sud Menderata. Uh, she is our al alum uh, from class of 2006, is actually uh, my classmate. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when it started, we were supporting each other to see you know, how we're gonna see patient better, how we're gonna get through these. And she shared with me uh, the hybrid uh, telehealth that she uh, studying at the Cleveland Clinic. So Shalini Sud Menderata, she's an assistant professor of clinical ophthalmology from the Cole Eye Institute, Cleveland Clinic. Good morning, my name is Shalini Sud Menderata. I'm one of the glaucoma specialists and staff physicians at the Cleveland Clinic Cole Eye Institute. Um, today I'm speaking about the hybrid teleglaucoma. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So telehealth, telemedicine are interchangeable terms. It's a real-time interaction over audio and video platforms between a physician and a patient who's in a location distance from the healthcare professional. Previously, telehealth was reserved for remote and underserved communities for screening and co-management purposes. We've utilized it uh, with limited utilization due to our specialized exams and diagnostic testing, but the pandemic has created demand for high quality, efficient tele-ophthalmology care and patients, providers, and payers are all more open to telemedicine as an option for patient care. Reimbursement was previously self-paid, but now the pandemic has led to CMS payment of these types of visits, as well as the relaxation of the Privacy Act to allow for the use of non-HIPAA compliant platforms. As has been reviewed before, there's uh, different types of visits, the synchronous and the asynchronous visits, and CMS has extended coverage until December of 2021. The virtual visits are based on, um, based on e &M level of coding or based upon time. And telephone visits are also based upon time. So our experience at the Cleveland Clinic, basically looking at our virtual visits from March 19th, that's the beginning of the uh, lockdown 2020 to end of July 2020, uh, looked at uh, the number of virtual visits that we completed. And I would say that we looked at this window because Ohio did start opening up in um, May, and thereafter we were pretty much at 75% of our patient volumes in June, and then by the summer we were about 90% plus. So at that point, our virtual visits did decline um, as we had more patients coming in person to see us. Um, but that being said, we completed about 2,600 virtual visits during that time period, and you can see the breakdown amongst the subspecialties of different uh, the number of visits that were completed by each subspecialty group, and then in parentheses uh, that just refers to the number of specialists or providers in each subspecialty. So hybrid virtual visits look to address the barriers that we have in office as well as telemedicine barriers. So within you know, patients seeing us in office, the barriers include insurance coverage, um, financial reasons for, they, for reasons they may not be able to come see us, time um, with regards to our patients who are working, transportation, for our patients who rely on family members or friends to come in to see us, and then most recently the COVID pandemic. With regards to the telemedicine barriers, we know that there's limited exam information that can be ascertained through telemedicine virtual visits, limited data, and then of course accessibility of technology on the part of our patients who may or may not have internet access, and then as providers, previously we didn't have the most user-friendly platforms for these types of virtual visits, and that part continues to evolve. So what are hybrid virtual visits? It's essentially an outpatient data collection coupled with a virtual clinician appointment. The goal is to decrease the time and exposure in the office while still being able to obtain meaningful data for more valuable virtual visit. There's varying amounts of times that are spent in the office versus outside the office, depending on the data collected, which includes vision, pressure, or other diagnostic tests. This is a poster that we presented of our experience this year at AGS was a retrospective chart review of 70 patients, 72 hybrid visits from the same time period, April 1st, 2020 to the end of July, 2020. We see that uh, it tended to be more female patients who utilized these visits. The age was slightly less than 60 years old and more than 50% of patients had vision greater than 2030. With regards to the glaucoma, di glaucoma diagnoses that were seen, the vast majority of patients were primary open angle glaucoma and when we looked at the severity, it favored those patients who had more severe and moderate disease, which makes sense that these patients may be more invested in 
um, being seen to ensure that there is stability of their disease. Every patient had vision and pressure measured in the office with 15% performed at home visual acuity. The diagnostic test included visual field of CT, RNFL of the macula, as well as pachymetry. 17% of patients had medication changes, 6% had SLT scheduled, and 6% had surgery scheduled based on these visits. Follow-up visits following the virtual hybrid um, visits were the majority of patients five weeks to five months, and 97% of those patients did follow up in person as opposed to virtual, and 65% had diagnostic testing on follow up. In conclusion, 29% of the hybrid visits resulted in change in intervention, and this did support the feasibility for data collection to facilitate our decision making in our glaucoma patients. So, is there a role for hybrid visits post pandemic? We do know that there's been adoption of telehealth and other subspecialties of medicine. Patients in general are more accepting of telehealth, though the utilization tends to be greater in the younger and higher socioeconomic status groups. This is an alternative appointment for patients facing other barriers to access, but on the other, side, other hand, there are technological barriers for patients and providers. That being said, as our patients are being vaccinated, more of them are now coming back to see us and many of them have not been seen for a year and we're seeing a much higher volume of patients that need access and are having to wait longer to come back and see us. So is the hybrid visit a possible solution to um, providing greater access for our patients as they are trying to come back to see us in person? So when do we implement? I do find that there should be a separate half day or time dedicated to telemedicine. If you try to go back and forth between the in-person visits and the telemedicine visits, it's very difficult to, to kind of switch back and forth and it's not really the most efficient use of your time. Patients come in for testing possibly on days when you're not in the office, like the OR days or administrative days. And then long-term, is there eventually a time that we may do these on weekends or off days as an imaging center? Who would benefit from hybrid visits? Patients requiring repeat testing in the near future. I find that patients who've had a poor reliability test on visual field may be good candidates for this. Patients who have progression on testing, but they require another diagnostic test before a clin clinical decision is made. Um, if you have a new patient coming in who now appears to be a glaucoma suspect, they could return for further testing. Cataract measurements. We have so many different um, premium lens options, torque lens options, um, that we could follow up with a discussion, um, as well as discussing all the, the types of mixed procedures that may be available that might benefit from se separate time as a virtual visit. And finally, remote physiological monitoring or RPM for our low tension glaucoma patients, patients with elevated pressure related to medications, surgical patients, or non-compliant or high risk monocular patients. How do we implement? Patients are scheduled for the hybrid testing appointment, the technician checks the visual acuity, the pressure with a non-contact tonometer, and then performs the required testing. The follow-up virtual visit then is used to discuss results, review medications, adherence, renew any prescriptions, and then a discussion of clinical management, including intervention as well as follow-up. RPM requires patient education, dispensing of the device, return of the device, uploading, downloading data into the EMR, interpretation of the data, and then a follow-up virtual visit as described above. RPM or remote physiological monitoring may be what helps us bridge the gap in feasibility of virtual visits. We see here the high care home tenometer, which is an FDA approved device where patients self check their pressure at home throughout the day. Patients potentially could be more engaged in their care, more invested in their care, um, has the ability to possibly reduce in office time, the number of follow up visits and overall be a time saver for patients and providers. These are the codes that are new for RPM in 2019. Um, they address patient education, the recordings, the transmission of the data, and then finally the communication. That being said, that final code of 99457 instead could be replaced by a virtual hybrid visit. None of these um, codes can be reported on the same day as an eye exam in person. So um, is there also a possibility as we uh, innovate in the uh, visual field arena, such as virtual reality headsets or the Melbourne Rapid Field web-based applications, that that could also help um, us in providing greater feasibility of hybrid visits and virtual visits for our patients. So finally, why hybrid telehealth? Co the COVID pandemic has encouraged healthcare providers to re-examine how to provide safe, efficient, quality healthcare through telemedicine. Patients are open to telemedicine as an adjunct to traditional in-person medical visits. 
Hybrid visits have the potential to increase access and de decrease in office time. RPM expands telemedicine and Medicare now does cover and pay for RPM. Finally, as technological advancements occur, the potential utilization of telehealth and hybrid visits will increase. These are my references. And I thank you so much for your time and attention. If you have any further questions, please do email. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini, for that excellent talk and insight. And congratulations for uh, setting up a very successful hybrid uh, telehealth and in Cleveland Clinic. Uh, next speaker is Catherine Wong. She's our superstar medical student who looking into going to ophthalmology. I'm really, really um, excited about that opportunity and possibility. She uh, received the grant from the uh, Illinois Society for Prevention of Blindness to look into whether or not there are any uh, viral particles uh, detected on the um, ophthalmology equipment. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this session at the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary Glaucoma Symposium. My name is Katherine Wang, and I'm an M3 here at UIC College of Medicine. My presentation is titled Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 Detection on Ophthalmologic Equipment in a U.S. Academic Ophthalmology Center. I would like to thank Dr. Yadavali, Dr. Velikodath, Dr. Shukla, and my mentors Dr. V and Dr. Edward for working with me on this project. The study was funded by the Illinois Society for the Prevention of Blindness and supported by a grant from the NIH and an unrestricted departmental grant from Research to Prevent Blindness. Since December 2019, COVID-19 has rapidly spread across the globe and emerged as a global pandemic. There is limited information on particle presence and retention in ophthalmology clinics. There have been studies that examine particle presence on slit lamps and work surfaces, but there is no data related to Humphrey Field analyzer bowls and pneumotonometer tips. Our study aimed to determine if viral particles could be detected on ophthalmology equipment in eye clinics caring for both asymptomatic and high-risk patients of unknown COVID status examined in low-risk and high-risk designated rooms respectively. Samples were collected from the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary between September 1st and October 5th, 2020. Post-patient contact slit lamp and occluder samples were taken immediately after the patient left the room, and clean room samples were taken within an hour after the room was clean. HFA samples were collected after patients left the exam room, and pneumotonometer tip samples were collected after the last patient of the day left the clinic. Clinic personnel were not aware of the study to prevent sample collection bias. Samples were processed and analyzed at the UIC Genome Research Core via reverse prescription PCR testing. The assay efficiency was 100% and the sensitivity of the analysis method was 10 to the power 0.5 plasmid control. This table provides a breakdown of our samples. No COVID particles were detected in our 72 samples. This includes the samples that were taken from our high-risk and low-risk patients. Our HFA samples were collected from the chin and forehead rests and the lower one-third of the bowl. Our slit lamp samples were collected from the chin and forehead rests and areas on the slit lamp breast shields. Pneumotonometer tip samples were collected after the last patient of the day left the clinic. So our study found that with current clinic protocol, including universal masking, cleaning, and COVID questionnaire screening, COVID viral particles were not detected on any ophthalmologic equipment. This study differs from previous studies because the IEI has universal masking and triage mandates. We also looked at particle presence on equipment commonly used in ophthalmology outpatient clinics, and the samples were collected over a five-week period presenting a snapshot of day-to-day -day operations. The IEI is located in Cook County, and the test positivity rate in the county during the time that we were collecting samples was 5.7%. This leads us to estimate that around 130 COVID-19 positive individuals may have received or provided care in the eye clinics. The study provides objective data about the low risk for patients and healthcare personnel to contaminate equipment in ophthalmology clinics when following COVID-19 protocols. Further studies are needed to investigate the clinical relevance of these findings. Thank you very much for listening to my talk and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Excellent work, Catherine, thank you.
Uh, so now I would like to invite our panelists, Dr. Yao Lu, Dr. Shalini Sudmanirata, and Dr. Angel Skinzara and Dr. Joshua Stein to join us for discussion. If you can turn on your camera, we can actually uh, spotlight you to join. I don't see any questions yet from the audience. So um, thank you all uh, for joining and also all for the excellent presentation and sharing your insight. Um, has the vaccination actually changed your clinic protocol? That's the first question. I don't know who, who whoever like to answer. That's an interesting question because the CDC just came out with that uh, recommendation of if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. So, um, of course, patients were talking about that yesterday. I, you know, I, I don't foresee the Cleveland Clinic uh, uh, adjusting our, you know, protocol. Everyone still has to be masked in the clinic, uh, but it will be really interesting to see where we are a month or two from now as we get closer and closer to herd immunity. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, been my experience at Kellogg as well, uh, even though, um, you know, even though a lot of, I, I think about 85, 90% of my patients uh, have at least gotten one shot, um, we're not really changing any of the ways we're managing, you know, we're, we're doing precautions and managing patients. Um, obviously, you know, we, we recently, uh, are experiencing a spike in COVID, uh, as many of you have heard. So um, I don't think that we're going to make any changes anytime in the near future, but it'll be interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, I heard a lot about these great uh, telehealth and how we can in increase our ac uh, patient care access, but that also somewhat only apply to people who have access to technology. So do you see any uh, policy changes or anything that we can do to decrease that gap in the future? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so, um, you know, obviously um, patients um, who have lower socioeconomic status often have more difficulty um, uh, doing the virtual telehealth visits because you often need a smartphone or some other device with a camera. Um, I've actually found um, also in our rural patient population, the lack of broadband internet access has also been a big barrier. Um, some of the ways that we've resolved that is that um, I've uh, actually predominantly used phone telemedicine visits, which a lot of patients are very comfortable with, um, really have very <laughs> few technical problems compared to um, arranging and setting up um, the uh, video visit. Um, also, some um, healthcare providers have um, given patients an option where they actually physically come into clinic. Um, this is often done in behavioral health where the video part is very important in terms of mental health um, and substance abuse counseling, where the patients actually physically do come into clinic, but they come into a, a room by themselves where the technology is already set up for them to do the telehealth virtual visit with the provider in a different space. So um, there are a lot of very innovative ways of providing the technology to folks. Um, also, there's uh, some movement towards having um, home delivery uh, of uh, equipment um, as well, um, such as specialized uh, testing equipment. Um, there's been some written about that as well. Um, so I think it'll be really exciting to see, you know, the use of uh, technologies that we typically have thought of as office-based um, being delivered to the patient for uh, rental or short-term use. I'll say from our perspective, um, Tasra, you can speak on this as well. We had issues with telehealth from the provider side at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that was prior to switching to Epic. And so we didn't have the telehealth platform. And um, the first few were, there were several issues. And so it was harder for providers to really commit to the telehealth visits at the beginning. Now it's so much easier. I know that the FQHC out here, they actually had got grant funding and they gave out iPads to people who needed to uh, receive telehealth care if they didn't have anything. Um, I'm curious to see if, if there will be expansion of something like that. Yeah, I agree. I think other countries who ha uh, that have universal health care coverage have uh, done these telehealth or tele visits for quite some time and they have 
maybe coordinated care with the hub in the community that the patient can come into the community and connect to the expert and that can also going to increase the access uh, to everyone. Yeah. I think we have a question before about the surgery. Dr. Salem at the beginning of the symposium asked about, you know, the has COVID pandemic changed your favorite surgery that you perform? So I, I just like to address here. I hope she's still here. I, I don't think it has changed um, too much other than I just naturally, like I had explained earlier, kind of progressed to um, the Zen and I do find the less follow-up has been very helpful, very helpful. Yeah, I don't think it's changed much my decision-making in terms of, you know, um, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, as glaucoma specialists, we're usually thinking, you know, how's this patient going to be doing 10, 20, 30 years from now? And, um, you know, and, and I think a lot of our decisions about what we're going to recommend for surgery, it's going to be more focused on that than what particular issue, be it COVID or whatever we're dealing with uh, at a particular time. Obviously, you know, some of these surgeries require more uh, aggressive monitoring and follow-up in the short term. And if you have a patient who you don't think will be able to do that, that may influence decision-making. But um, the extent COVID altered that, I don't think it did too much in my case. Thank you so much. So hopefully some of the televisit can help us to reach out to people who can't come for the post-op uh, um, as well. So any other comments, anything? I think, let's see. Uh, I think I don't see any other uh, questions from the audience and Dr. Uh, Edward helped to answer some in the chat box. So thank you all again uh, for participating and for all the excellent uh, presentation and sharing insights. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So for the next session, we will have the Samuel Schoenberg JD lecture. So the introduction also will be given by Dr. Jacob T. Malinsky. It is a real pleasure to introduce to you uh, Cynthia Maddox. Uh, who will be uh, delivering the Samuel Schoenberg uh, lecture this year. Uh, Mr. Schoenberg was a patient of ours uh, for many years. Uh, uh, he had glaucoma. Uh, he was a very successful lawyer here in Chicago. Uh, and after he passed his away his wife uh, endowed this lectureship in his memory uh, uh, to continue the support of the glaucoma program at the U of I, which the two of them had started while he was still alive, uh, making contributions to support our research and uh, other activities. Um, and uh, it uh, and we are very uh, honored that uh, we have been able to continue this uh, lectureship through the years uh, with uh, a tremendous number of outstanding speakers who have been here. And Dr. Maddox uh, is a worthy uh, person to continue this uh, tradition. Uh, Dr. Maddox, uh, received her undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, then uh, did her residency in ophthalmology at Centaur Norfolk General Hospital. Um, she uh, then uh, joined the uh, Department of Ophthalmology at uh, Tufts University in Boston, uh, but more than that, she became extremely active in the uh, American uh, Glaucoma Society uh, 
and then the American Academy of Ophthalmology, where she became uh, an outstanding advocate for ophthalmology and uh, glaucoma, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the federal government and uh, uh, Medicare reimbursement and items like that. Um, I think I remember that she also was a uh, president of the American Glaucoma Society. And I attended many sessions where she uh, educated us uh, on uh, the intricacies of uh, funding uh, for, through Medicare for glaucoma procedures and uh, then uh, taught us how to uh, code our patient uh, visits uh, to maximize uh, reimbursement and things like that. Uh, so it is a real uh, pleasure to have her here and she will speak to us about the mysteries of uh, physician payment and advocacy uh, and I am looking forward to hearing her again. Thank you. So thank you, Tassarat, for inviting me to be part of the symposium today. Um, I hope to shed a little light on uh, the mysteries of physician payment and uh, just explain a number of ways that you can get involved uh, in um, the process. These are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to this talk. And I'm honored to be giving the Samuel Schoenberg Memorial Glaucoma Lectureship. Uh, this was established in 1990 by Irene T. Schoenberg, uh, Mr. Schoenberg's wife, to honor Jacob Walensky, whom you all know and love. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Walensky. It's always wonderful to have grateful patients. And uh, part of what we're talking about today is advocacy on behalf of these patients and even involving these patients sometimes um, in order to ensure that we get fair payment for our services. So thank you. Physician payment is complicated. Uh, there are lots of different payers, uh, private payers, commercial insurance, Medicare, and then there's Medicare Managed Care, Medicare Advantage or Part C, those are all the same thing. And of course there's Medicaid and even Medicaid has managed care plans as part of their um, processes. So it's no secret that the U.S. spends a lot of money on health care. Uh, this is just one way of looking at it. These were projections of national health expenditure for all payments, not just physician payments for 2019. And private payers um, a slice of the pie is $1.29 trillion. Um, Medicare is no slouch at $800.7 billion in expenditures. Um, and they're continuing to increase over time. Medicare in particular is expanding um, uh, and projected to expand partly from the um, aging of the population. Now, Insurance for glaucoma patients, as we know, is primarily Medicare. Um, just taking a look at the IRIS registry data for 2017, you can see that Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and dual eligible Medicare and Medicaid patients account for over 55% of the patients in IRIS registry. So we pay a lot of attention to Medicare, and that's uh, for good reason. Medicare oftentimes dictates what happens in the private payer arena as well. So, you know, physicians oftentimes feel disenfranchised and feel like they have no say in the process of physician payment and consider it a black box. Um, but hopefully after today, I'll shed a little light, make it a little more transparent and make you feel that there are places where you can get involved and not only can, but it's important that you do. So physicians get paid for uh, procedures, they get paid for tests and office visits. And every time you see the splash of neon green, um, 
it will be an indicator to you that there's something you can do about it, and I'm going to tell you on that um, area of the talk. So stay tuned for all those places. And reimbursement depends upon coding. Um, we're all familiar with the CPT codes, uh, current procedural terminology. Each service that physicians provide to our patients has a five-digit code ass assigned to it. And there's several categories of codes. Category one codes are the primary ones that have been reviewed and valued and have a an ass payment assigned to them. So they're primarily what we get paid upon. But there are other categories, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You might be interested to know that CPT is maintained and copyrighted by the AMA. They do make quite a bit of money um, from all the educational resources and uh, books they sell and CDs and all that stuff. So um, it is a system that is integrated into the AMA system. I'm not going to have a chance to go into the entire CPT process, but uh, CPT Category 1 codes do have set criteria. Um, if there is a drug or device invo involved in the service, it has to be FDA approved before it can have a Category 1 assigned to it. Um, it has to be performed across the country, multiple locations, many physicians performing the service, and its efficacy has to be well established and documented in the peer review literature. Uh, so there is a whole CPT committee that meets three times a year to look at new CPT codes and to revise old CPT codes. And uh, uh, so we do see that happening in ophthalmology quite a bit due to um, our new technology and evolving technology. Once it, there is a new CPT code or a revised CPT code in Category 1, it then needs to go through a process to determine what its value is, how much an ultimately payment will be assigned to that CPT code. And that's the process we're going to spend most of the time talking about today. This is the system. Uh, you're probably familiar with the term the RUC. That's the committee that works with the Medicare resource-based value, relative value system which so coincidentally happened to go into effect in 1992, the, my very first year of practicing ophthalmology. So I have seen and grown up with the system, um, and it still lives today, uh, continues to evolve, but it still has basic premises of creating a relative value for a code relative to the value of another code. And it's all relative. So that's the concept behind the relative value unit, whether it's within your own specialty or with between specialties, um, comparing what a podiatrist does as a procedure versus what an ophthalmologist does as a procedure versus what a primary care uh, practitioner does for a service. So it is complex and it's a difficult task, uh, but let's break it down. So. Um, to start with, there are three components to the relative value unit, the RVU. Uh, first is physician work, second is practice expense, and third is the professional liability insurance, which is a small piece of it. The RUC, the Relative Value Update Committee, is a group of volunteer physicians, all of medicine are represented, um, and what happens at a RUC committee meeting is that societies like the Academy, American Academy of Ophthalmology, will present to the RUC um, and explain why their codes should have an RVU, um, uh, specifically the physician work RVU, should be accepted by the RUC uh, committee members. The RUC then makes a recommendation, just a recommendation, to CMS. Uh, it is an advisory body to CMS. It does not have any um, authority over the code valuation. It just makes a recommendation. And then CMS makes a final decision about the payment values. But even that decision goes through another two processes. First, a proposed rule is published in the Federal Register right before July 4th. It always happens before July 4th weekend. 
And in that proposed rule, they're now required to uh, explain what valuation they will assign to those codes that have gone through the RUC committee review process. Then there's a period of time, about 60 days, in order to comment. We'll talk about that. And finally, they put out a final rule in November, and uh, this is always eagerly anticipated right around Thanksgiving. So uh, the final rule comes out, and uh, whatever is in that final rule um, is what will be implemented typically in the following January. So physician work is obviously the biggest portion and most important portion that we have some input on uh, for how the physician work component of the total RVU is determined. And the criteria that they look at to determine the work RVU are the time it takes to perform the service, the technical skill, physical effort, uh, mental effort, the judgment involved, and even the stress due to what would happen to the patient if it was there was a poor outcome, the stress involved to the physician for a poor outcome. Now, who is able to tell us those kinds of qualities of a service except for the physicians who perform the service? Therefore, what happens after a code is um, up for valuation is a survey goes out from the specialty society to a random group of its members, uh, and a survey is offered to that member, uh, and they will be asked these kinds of questions on the survey in a numerical fashion um, to compare the code that's being valued to existing codes. So there you go, that's your first opportunity. If you are one of the random uh, people who are selected uh, to, to complete a survey, please do it. We, the Academy needs survey respondents in order to pro provide good input to the RUC committee about the valuation of a particular service. So um, please ask if you uh, think it's, uh, there's a survey going around, you can volunteer sometimes, but mostly it's supposed to be a random sample. So the physician work, which we just talked about, uh, makes up about 51% of the value of a given code, um, the work RVU uh, in the purple here. And the practice expense is not inconsequential. It makes almost approximately 45% of uh, the total RVU. Um, and that's determined independently based on uh, the resources involved and the practice expenses that have been documented uh, by the RUC committee. Um, now there's a special subcommittee that looks at that. It doesn't get reviewed very often. In fact, I don't think it's been re-reviewed for practice expenses since 2006. So obviously there's some problems with that, um, but there it is. And the malpractice RVU is a very small part of it, but still there. Um, the total RVU is the add, addition of all those components, and then it's modified by a geographic factor due to the fact that um, metropolitan areas probably cost more to provide a service than, um, than a more rural area. So the total RVU is then calculated and multiplied by what's called the conversion factor. The conversion factor is set yearly by CMS based on the entire pile of money that they have to send to physicians for payment for that, um, their services. And unfortunately, that conversion factor has to be budget neutral. But by calculating the total RVU and multiplying by, by the conversion factor, that is the assigned Medicare payment for that CPT code. So 
how does CMS decide which codes to revalue on any given year? Well, you already heard if it's a new CPT code or if it's a revised CPT code, but they also go through these screens looking for codes that could potentially be misvalued. In an ideal world, they would like to revise every code every five years. That's obviously way too much to do with all the codes in the universe. So they look for the low hanging fruit. And in green, I've highlighted uh, a number of the reasons why ophthalmology codes become targeted. Um, oftentimes we do two procedures together. Uh, think about eye stent and cataract surgery. That is a reason to get a revaluation. Um, anything that's high volume growth uh, think about OCT and anti-VEGF and uh, intravitreal injections. Those kinds of things will um, easily get targeted by CMS. And post-operative visits, ophthalmology and glaucoma in particular, trabeculectomy gets pulled up on this screen for post-operative visits all the time. Um, and uh, that's a problem for us because we have to keep explaining why the post-operative visits are um, are necessary. And of all new technology tends to get targeted as well. So putting it all together, this is the process. Um, the category one CPT codes get developed um, or CMS targets particular codes. They send a list of the codes that they want reviewed to the specialty society, in our case, the academy. The academy can review the list, explain why uh, they agree that it should be valued, revalued, or explain why it isn't. For example, it might have just been revalued a couple of years ago, and they tend not to um, keep revaluing except every five years if they can. So once the codes are settled on as to what shall be reviewed, um, the Academy will send out that random sample uh, to physicians who perform the service. And those physicians, like you, um, can fill out the survey. Now, you'd think that probably a lot of people would do this, but unfortunately they don't. The uh, typical rate of return for the surveys once they go out is somewhere in the order of 35 to 75 um, surveys coming back to the academy. So please fill out these uh, surveys when you can. If you have trouble understanding how to fill them out, contact the Academy Health Policy people. They will um, explain what's involved with it. It's, it's a um, process and I think they actually put together a, a video so you can understand what you need to do to fill out each section. Once the surveys come back to the Academy, they have an expert committee uh, that knows all about this process. They analyze the data. They re-review all the relative codes in other specialties, and they defend um, and support the valuation of uh, the RVU if, for the physician work to the entire RUC committee. Um, the presentation is live to the RUC committee members. The RUC committee members then vote uh, about whether to agree with the recommendation of the specialty society or to modify it in some way. And then the RUC sends it on to CMS. And as I mentioned, the RUC is advisory, CMS gets the final say, and the first glimmer that we find uh, out what CMS is thinking is in that proposed rule in the beginning of July. And that's your second opportunity. So now you've read the proposed rule, you've heard about it from the academy or your subspecialty society or your state society. And once you understand what is being proposed by Medicare, you have an opportunity to comment either as an individual or through those other organizations that you are members with. Um, and it's easy to do. You do it through regulations.gov um, and you explain uh, your position and why you either support or disagree with the valuation that the CMS has come up with. Um, in doing it as an individual, it's great to explain patient stories um, and really show the impact of their decision from CMS onto your real life practice. So I want to take you through 
um, a case study of what happened in 2015-2016 and how uh, we navigated this process. So um, trabeculectomy and the retinal detachment CPT codes were up for revaluation before the RUC in early 2015. The academy's groups um, felt like we successfully defended our payments and the RUC agreed with our recommendations for payment and RVU valuation. CMS, however, rejected those RUC recommended values. Not only did they reject them, they slashed them considerably uh, by 33%. Uh, back in those days, uh, there wasn't a requirement for CMS to explain their rationale for cutting codes um, in the proposed rule. And the first time we found out about it was in the final rule in November. Uh, because of this huge impact that happened that year, uh, they changed the rules. And so that's a good thing too. Uh, but uh, what happened once we found out is we lobbied hard to fight the cuts through the American Glaucoma Society. The Academy joined forces with us um, and we sent in lots and lots of uh, formal comments and individual comments through that process that we mentioned before. We had a massive campaign uh, through the OPTPAC contacts that the Academy had to congressmen, senators, also grassroots efforts with our patients. And we were granted a refinement panel where it was basically a tribunal where we were allowed to present our case again uh, to this uh, group of peer surgeons um, to explain what we thought the proper valuation should be, and uh, they agreed with us. So after a year, by 2017, the payments did revert to the RUC approved values, and we were successful. But it just shows that you need a lot of effort, a lot of behind the scene effort and work um, from your societies and from individuals and uh, just keep in mind, although we were successful, past performance does not predict future results, as they say, in the stock market. So we're gonna switch gears a bit and talk about CPT category three codes. Category three codes you're probably familiar with because glaucoma has a lot of them over the past decade. Um, they are temporary codes that are assigned primarily for new technologies. Um, they're intended to allow time for data collection, for, um, to determine efficacy, widespread usage. There may be an F ongoing FDA trial, for example. And you're familiar with um, iStent and Zen and a number of our testing procedures that have all had Category 3 codes over the past years. What happens to a Category 3 code is it has no physician payment value assigned to it yet because it hasn't gone through that RUC process. It doesn't meet the criteria for a category one code. So it automatically gets assigned to the non-covered list, meaning there's no automatic coverage for these procedures. Um, and not only that, uh, there's no payment associated with it. So the only pathway to having these um, category three codes paid um, by Medicare is to go through each and every individual Medicare regional contractor carrier. Now the carriers, there's a number of them. As you can see on this map, um, each region is divided uh, and there's a lot fewer of them than there used to be. And now there also has been some co consolidation. You can see, for example, NGS, which is the uh, Medicare um, contractor for Illinois, also is the contractor for New England and New York. And more and more, the various regions have combined their um, policies and keep, try to keep them uniform between the various regions. You can see Noridian takes care of nearly half of, uh, over half of the western part of the United States, and others are quite small. So um, each carrier can have a different policy, can have a different payment rate. Now oftentimes category three codes and some category one codes 
are um, written up in what's called a local carrier determination. That's an LCD for short, and it's um, part of your Medicare contractor carrier in your region will publish these guidelines. They're basically guidelines to help you code correctly, to show what that carrier believes are the indications and which uh, CPT codes will be covered by that procedure. For example, there might be a glaucoma procedure that is covered for primary open angle glaucoma and pigmentary glaucoma, but not covered for no normal tension glaucoma. So you need to know these LCDs in your region and you need to pay attention to them because oftentimes they are also used by auditors who can come into your office and try to recoup payment um, for the Medicare system if you have not been following the guidelines correctly. So work with your um, with your state society primarily. Sometimes the subspecialty societies get involved in this, but this is your opportunity to make sure that the L any LCD that is written is um, clinically appropriate. And also if there is a payment discussion going on with the Medicare carrier, that it's an appropriate payment for the service involved and comparable to what you would expect from some other similar procedure. So get to know your Medicare carrier medical director. Um, your state society should, should know these people and help you interact with them if it's, if it's necessary. The academy also has uh, a person for each state or region as uh, part of their carrier advisor committee. You can also talk to them. And sometimes it requires you writing letters or going to a uh, uh, MAC meeting um, in person in order to present your point of view about valuation and coverage. Just a couple other things uh, to make sure that you understand some of the differences. Um, there are facility payments for procedures uh, for hospital outpatient departments and ambulatory surgery centers that are completely different than for what goes on in your doc in a physician's office. And they have their own set of rules. Um, they have their own set of rate setting. Um, if you will, and it is a very complex system, except that for ophthalmology, there literally are only five categories of facility payment. Therefore, so a procedure like trabeculectomy um, has the exact same facility payment as cataract surgery. Now, you can think about it a little bit. Cataract surgery has a lot of inputs, right? It has an, a lens implant, it has um, viscoelastic, it has a bottle of BSS, it might have intracameral antibiotics, all sorts of inputs that are um, used by that facility payment. And trabeculectomy, well, we've got a couple of sutures. So in some ways, um, they are different, but trabeculectomy might take a little longer than a cataract surgery. So um, that's how they group together the CPT codes into these categories uh, with a complex metric. Now, and as I sort of alluded to, a facility payment is a bundling of all the supplies and drugs and in, um, resources used for that procedure. Um, there are some exception, exceptions for new technology and pass-through drugs and that sort of thing that are a little I uh, won't have time to go into, but um, facility payments are set and are based on the CPT system as well. A few more things to know uh, about physician payment. Medicare Advantage plans, the managed care Medicare plans, have to cover every single procedure that fee-for-service Medicare does. If they're not covering something that's approved by Medicare, or pay, being paid by Medicare, you need to contact them and point that out to them. If they still refuse, you need to move it up higher to CMS, to the oversight committees, because um, they are required to do so. And some of the smaller um, uh, Medicare Advantage plans, or the new ones, don't always understand those rules. And of course, private payers, commercial payers, commercial plans, they can do whatever they want. Uh, they can restrict access, they can limit uh, what codes are involved with payment, uh, they might 
provide a lower payment for the same procedure as Medicare, they might have a higher payment, they might have no payment. So it's really important that um, I've been talking a lot about Medicare and getting to know your Medicare system, but it's also important to establish connections with medical directors of your main prime, private payers uh, that affect your practice. And make sure that any policies they have in place are appropriate. And a lot of them do have policies and they're welcome input from the physicians whom they are working with. A few more things. Um, Congress can change the rules. That's good um, because things like budget neutrality may need to be adjusted um, over time. Maybe the system doesn't work the way it should anymore with the conversion factor ratcheting down or being different. Sequestration, they put sequestration, a 2% cut across the board for all physician services, and then they kept extending it till 2025. Um, they had a little moratorium here during the pandemic, but it's back into effect. And that 2% is set to continue until 2025. Um, that's a pay cut for us. So um, Congress uh, is still out there and uh, can be, um, uh, part of the solution uh, by advocacy. So your fifth opportunity is to get involved knowing your members of Congress, knowing your senators, uh, support your PAC. OPTHPAC has great connections and will can help you make appointments with your legislatures. Um, at your state level, you can uh, work with them as well uh, by supporting your state society. Uh, Advocate, go to Advocacy Day. Some special subspecialties like the AGS has a subspecialty day every four years. So um, get involved. Um, advocacy ambassadors and leadership development programs are there for you younger people who are in fellowship or residency or who are just starting out in your practice if you want to get involved. Um, there's a, a way to do that with some funding for that through your state society, through the academy and your subspecialty society. So, um, so get involved. Uh, and just a final note, IRIS registry. I know you've heard a lot about big data today, but big data is important and health policy people are, um, and Congress people and senators are interested in that data. And the IRIS registry is another place that can um, inform health policy, um, help Policymakers make good decisions and also is a way for us to show the value of our services so that we do get reimbursed appropriately um, uh, for our services and to the benefit of our patients so that we can provide a sustainable environment for taking good care of our patients. So thank you very much. Uh, wishing you sunshine and clear sailing and uh, some warm weather coming soon. And I'm afraid that after all of this um, big talk that I've given uh, about physician payment, it can be a little depressing. Uh, so I'm also sending you a warm hug from a cute little puppy. So uh, thanks again for involving me in this symposium and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Metok, for such a wonderful talk and all your leadership and everything that you do uh, for us. I would like to invite you, if you can open, uh, turn on your camera, we can spot, spotlight you on the... I think I'm there now. Okay. Let's see. Thanks. How's the weather in Hawaii, right? Oh, it's pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> early here, but it's like a nice day. Yeah. So if, if this is in person, we'll be presenting you with the flag. So I have Dr. Walensky here also to give some remarks. Well, you did not disappoint me. You uh, are continuing what you've done throughout your career. And we really appreciate your taking the time and effort and the fact that you're continuing to do this work in your retirement. All the best to you. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. It's been a pleasure. Well, I don't see any question yet uh, from the audience if, you, if uh, anyone would like to ask question. This is a good time to um, chime in and, and add question in the chat box. 
So Dr. Metzger, anything that we should watch for another policy that's coming in and then how COVID actually could help to prevent any of the cuts and things that uh, we should look for? Well, it's, it's interesting you should mention COVID. I mean, um, one thing that's coming forward in 2022 is actually across all medicine and also across all other agencies, they're required to um, pay for some of these relief uh, funding that they have provided um, to all the industries uh, um, that our government supports. And so that actually is going to result in possibly a cut um, going forward. I think it's projected to be about a 4% cut. So um, that will come uh, around for negotiation. Um, I also noticed in my talk, I think a couple of the important features of the conversion factor, um, I uh, must have muted out by accident, I apologize for that, but um, the conversion factor is budget neutral, um, is how they come up, up with that number. And you're gonna hear a lot coming forward this year um, about advocacy events surrounding the, um, the budget neutrality issue. Um, because there's only one big pie and it's trying to be divided again uh, through all of medicine, what's effectively happening is they're trying to increase payments to uh, primary care physicians, which we're fine with, uh, they deserve increased payments, sure. But um, because they increase payments to primary care, all the other uh, specialties will suffer by having lower payments. So the, the overall idea is that they need to figure out a way how to get Congress to give us a bigger piece of the pie. Um, and there are ha you'll see a lot of information from the Academy showing how um, with inflation adjusted dollars, um, ophthalmology practices, physician practices and pa physician payment are going down. Um, hospitals and other parts of uh, pharmaceuticals, that sort of thing have just slightly increased over time. So um, physician payments, you know, they have to be sustainable. So budget neutrality, you'll hear quite a lot about as a something that needs to be addressed. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, anyone else have any questions and any comments for uh, Dr. Mehta? So uh, we would like to take some photos. So uh, Peter gonna take a screenshot of, of these photos to be with you, Dr. Mehta. So everybody you. smile. <laughs> okay, so I, and also invite Dr. Uh, Stein to also come join us. Ooh, I think I replaced all, so we have to do one more time quickly. Do we have everyone? Okay. Yes. Okay, wonderful. One more time. Smile. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So next we will move on to our uh, clinical challenges. So I hope that um, our uh, Invited speakers can also uh, stay on to discuss cases. We have Dr. Giovanni uh, Bassian and Dr. Michael Henry. Thanks to so lead much, the discussion. Yes. Thank you for inviting us to do the to the uh, uh, last clinical cases. So we have for you three um, case presentations from our three outstanding residents uh, that will hopefully highlight some interesting questions uh, for the panel. Um, and for everyone else in the audience, if they can put some questions in the chat, then we will ask the, uh, the um, panelists to then um, give their thoughts at the end of the discussion. So we'll go ahead with our first presentation. I believe it's um, Dr. Catherine Chen will be first. Um, we will just put her presentation up and she will be giving it live. All right, can you guys all hear me? Yes, perfect. Go ahead, Catherine. So um, I'm Catherine. I'm one of the PGY2s. 
Um, and so I'll be discussing a case today. So I have no financial disclosures for this talk. And the case is going to be a 16 year old male who presented to our clinic with recurrent episodes of redness and pain in the right eye. Um, it was noted that his pressure in that eye was up to 50. And he states that recently his pupil was no longer round. And although he has poor vision at baseline due to a scar in that eye, um, he's had further recent decrease in his vision. So when he presented to our clinic, his uh, acuity was hand motion in that eye and 2050 pinholing to 2025 in that left eye. And his pressures were 44 and 14. So this uh, here is just an external photograph showing both eyes. You can see that um, he has a slight XT in that right eye and also appears slightly microphthalmic. And on closer inspection, we can see that he has an irregular and ectopic pupil with some posterior synechiae and kind of a smooth cripless iris surface with diffuse neovascularization. Um, we can also see a one millimeter hyphema inferiorly. And although the cornea appears clear, there is some sort of haziness within the pupil. So this is the left eye, which of course looks normal. And going back to that right eye now on closer look, we can see that there is this fibrotic material and vitreous hemorrhage um, that we can see through the irregular pupil. And here on retroillumination, we again see this um, cyclitic membrane uh, visualized through the pupil and then some of that vitreous hemorrhage here. So we did do gonioscopy and he was closed uh, 360 and we re-visualized the hyphema inferiorly. And so at this point we did some further testing. Um, the view to the fundus was a little bit hazy. So we did get a B scan, which showed this uh, funnel retinal detachment. And then we also did a UBM, which showed this thick hyperreflective, like retrolental membrane or mass. So, um, Kind of looking at the differential diagnosis for neovascularization, uh, neovascular glaucoma, I'm sorry, in children and like young adults um, would include Coats disease, persistent fetal vasculature, intraocular tumors such as medulloepitheliomas or retinoblastoma, although um, it's kind of less likely to be retinoblastoma given this patient's age, uh, chronic traumatic retinal detachment, retinopathy of prematurity, uh, fever sickle cell retinopathy or diabetic retinopathy. And I just wanted to talk about a few of these uh, conditions briefly. So Coates disease um, is a disease with retinal telangiectasias and intraretinal subretinal exudates, which can cause exudative retinal detachments. Um, it's usually unilateral with a male predominance and generally diagnosed less than eight years old, but severe and late cases can lead to NVI and NVG. Um, PFV is a condition that's due to the failure of uh, the primary vascular vitreous to regress. Um, again, this is unilateral in 90% of cases with no associated systemic findings. And there's kind of a wide range of clinical findings involving both the anterior and posterior ocular tissues. So some examples are persistent pupillary membranes, Mittendorf dots, retro lentil membranes, Bergmeister papilla, and retinal folds. Uh, medulloepitheliomas are congenital tumors of the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium. Um, patients usually present between two to 10 years, although it can also manifest in adulthood. It's usually unilateral and generally asymptomatic until the tumors become large. Um, and you can have a coexistence of the persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous. Some clinical features include ciliary body masses, loss of zonules, um, Corctopia, ectropion, UVA, NVI, and then you can have the neoplastic cyclitic membranes with extension to the retrolental region. So um, I wanted to open it up to the audience now and see, you know, what would you guys do next in terms of management in this 16 year old male with hand motion vision, a pressure of 44, a closed angles and a funnel retinal detachment. Thank you. So, do any of our panelists want to add what they might do? I think it's, you know, it's a situation now where it's, um, it's a painful, nearly blind eye. Um, and I would approach it with that 
in mind. Um, you probably want to do as little as possible, but keep do what you can to help with his pain, which is what he primarily presented with. Um, uh, certainly a long-standing funnel RD in this young man is um, not repairable, um, but the neovascularization certainly is treatable. Um, so I would start with the neovascularization and we have really good drugs for that. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Dr. Maddox. I think that at, at this point, uh, unfortunately, the visual potential is very guarded and it's mainly uh, making sure the patient is comfortable um, and, you know, whether it's medical management, cycloplegics, anti-VEGFs, you know, um, corticosteroids, um, you know, there, there are certainly, uh, you know, less and more invasive ways to get the eye comfortable, um, but it's just, um, you know, figuring out with the patient and his, uh, you know, his uh, family members, you know, um, how aggressive they want to be and how uncomfortable he is um, in, in his present, you know, it, it seems like uh, his cornea was relatively clear, which means his pressures have probably been high for quite a while. So um, I don't know how uncomfortable he is at the present time. I just wanted to make a quick comment. I agree with everything that's been said. I think, you know, because this is a new presentation, oftentimes people will get really excited to see such a high pressure, but often in these um, glaucoma medication naive patients, they can respond very quickly to a relatively, you know, simple regimen of um, glaucoma topical um, medications. And so oftentimes they can be temporized relatively quickly with, with just medications. Uh, pressure 44 on no medications is quite different than uh, one where uh, they're already on several medications. That's a good point. The pressure would be a lot higher if he didn't have that RD also. So <laughs> that's probably helping in this situation. But um, the other thing not to forget is protective eyewear. Young males, anybody who's monocular um, needs to be counseled about that. Okay, perfect. So um, thanks so much. So what we ended up doing is kind of a combination of all of those. So we started the patient on maximum medical therapy. So we started some drops while he was in clinic, which improved his IOP from 44 to 34, and then kind of sent him home on Comigan, Dorzolamide, as well as Piomethazolamide. Um, we started him on atropine. Uh, we thought we might need a CPC at some point and then also referred this patient to retina for further evaluation of the uh, retinal detachment. So about a month later, um, the patient's IOP was uh, improved and well-controlled on the medical therapy. Um, we got some additional history. So the patient had no history of prematurity, no history of any ophthalmic diseases, including fever, no concern for retinoblastoma in childhood. And so they decided to uh, inject a Vastin for the neovascular glaucoma into the anterior chamber, given his retinal detachment, and um, thought that the findings might be suspicious for PFB given this retrolenticular opacity. So I, I have some additional photos. So this um, is showing the right eye again after the Avastin injection. We can see that there's resolution of the hyphema, but there's still a persistent uh, NVI. And on retroillumination, we again see this fibrotic material or membrane, which is possibly like regressed hyaloid vasculature, remnants of Clockett's canal here. And then we also noted that there was an area superior temporally with zonular loss and ectopia lentis of displacement of the lens inferonasally. And if we go back to the initial photograph, actually we see that here as well, shown by the arrow. So this is um, what the fundus looked like. Uh, this is an optos photo of that right eye. You can see that um, there's a small nerve. There's no obvious stalk. Um, and the view is a little bit hazy still because of this funnel retinal detachment, but no you know, obvious NVE or, or anything. So over the next few months, um, the patient continued to be followed. We were actually able to wean him off almost all of the medications. And he's now only on Timolol daily. Um, and the IOP continues to be well-controlled and there's no further need for Avastin at this time. 
So we thought this patient most likely has persistent fetal vasculature um, with a retinal detachment, retrolental fibrosis, and ectopia lentis. Um, so to summarize, uh, this patient is kind of an example of patient with PFV and associated NVG. Um, the eye did exhibit like unilateral features of the microphthalmia, the retrolental membrane, ectopia lentis with sonular maldevelopment and a funnel retinal detachment, which can all be suggestive of, of PFV syndrome. And despite the persistent NVI, he's doing really well um, in terms of his pressure with resolution of the hyphema, just with the medical therapy and one injection of the um, anti-VEGF treatment. And so um, we're going to continue to follow him, but there's no plans for needing CPC in the future at this time, at least, and no further need for future Avastin injections. So these are my references, and I just wanted to thank Dr. Edward um, for giving me this case, Dr. Mueller, Dr. Henry, and then also Dr. Boskin and Dr. V for letting me speak at this symposium. Great job, Catherine. Do any of the panelists have any experience with using anti-VEGF instead of CPC as one of the first line treatments? Yeah, I mean, I think it's for any patient with neovascular glaucoma, anti-VEGF is imperative. And uh, I would give it the very first time we meet that patient um, if we can clear the retina and understand what's um, behind the cloudy cornea, for example. Um, it, it, Anti-VEGF medications actually control pain very, very well, um, it, irregardless of the pressure. Um, so that has been shown in a number of studies how uh, the pain reduction just from using anti-VEGF um, is impressive, even with no change in the pressure. So I think it's, it's mandatory. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. The other thing is, you know, a lot of uh, more, a more common example would be a patient with neovascular glaucoma from PDR. Um, and you're thinking maybe not in doing a, a diode, but putting a tube in. And often when you abruptly lower the pressure and they have all this NVI, it bleeds like crazy. So uh, if you can do the anti-VEGF ahead of time and try to reduce the NVI, you'll likely get less bleeding if, even if you end up doing an incisional procedure um, to follow. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, there's some good data from the uh, retina literature showing that doing anti-VEGF injection about a week before vitrectomy reduces the risk of rebleeds for PDR um, when you're taking care of patients with recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. Um, and so we typically, our approach here um, is to treat the NVG from PDR with the vast injection, wait about a week, see if the pressure comes down. Sometimes it does on its own and you can actually avoid glaucoma surgery. I'd say I'd give it at least a week um, if, if you can, depending on what the pressure is um, before taking them to the OR, just because you can reduce the risk of bleeding uh, post-op as well as potentially averting the need for surgery. Great, thank you so much. We're gonna move on to case. I was just gonna make one comment about that last case. Uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, for whatever reason, this patient developed um, new vascular glaucoma after having had this condition, you know, presumably since birth, and the anti-VEGF that we injected at Avastin is gonna have a limited, you know, that's, that's gonna, the efficacy of that's gonna wear off over time. So I would just continue to follow this patient uh, and just make sure that that new vaccination, new the MBG doesn't return, and they may need, you know, if they responded well to Avastin the first time, they may need he may need uh, serial Avastin injections or some other treatment to prevent uh, the recurrent new vascularization. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So we're going to move on to our next case. If um, Dr. Mehta could upload her next presentation. Dr. Mehta is uh, one of the senior residents. She will be 
uh, glaucoma fellow at Duke next year. And it's been a pleasure to work with her over this past year. And Dr. Mehta, you have the floor. Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm Rajvi. I'm one of the PGY4s here at UIC. Um, so my next case is about a 69-year-old male who presented to our clinic for evaluation for cataract surgery in his left eye. Uh, the patient had a history of moderate POAG in the right eye, and he had had a trap with an expression in 2014. In that eye, he also uh, more recently um, had a trap for advanced glaucoma in the left eye, uh, which is the eye of interest. And this eye was, had a complicated intra-op and post-op course. So his exam findings on the left, uh, his visual acuity is 2400, doesn't uh, refract any better. Uh, pupil is irregular, no APD, uh, just some synechia. His IOP has been kind of stable at four to, the four to six range in both eyes. Um, and his pinhole PAM visual potential for the left eye that we measured was 2060 at the pre-op visit. Uh, we thought he could do a little better, but that's what we had. As far as his anterior segment on the right, he had that super temporal blip with the expression and a mild one plus NS cataract. On the left, he had a supranasal localized bleb, no leak, um, some striae on the cornea, nasally and supranasally near the bleb. Um, irregular pupil again with the posterior sinicae and then um, a, a patent PI. He also had a two plus NS cataract, two plus PSC, some wrinkles on the anterior capsule and uh, the posterior sinicae. On dilated exam, large cup to disc, both eyes, no choroidals, a bit of a hazy view through the cataract on the left. So as far as, um, you know, while reviewing his IOL calculations and looking at his topography, we noted he was, when he presented for the cataract surgery evaluation, at this point he was at post-op month three after his trap surgery, and we noted a pretty significant astigmatism of 8.29 diopters in the axis of the trap. Um, and just to review, we looked at his, the one pre-op corneal topography we had for that left eye from 2015, and he essentially had no, um, no astigmatism uh, previously on, in that eye. So just a little bit about the intra-op and post-op course for this patient. Like I mentioned, um, he had had a complicated uh, course overall. Intra-op, uh, he ended up having a large sclerostomy, uh, which required the scleral flap to be sutured down really tight with three scleral sutures. And I've tried to show the location of the, um, of the sutures here in this picture. Um, and then he had these corneal striae kind of leading up to the, the bleb side. And then postoperatively, he had to have multiple uh, chamber reformations. There wasn't really a clear leak that was noted postoperatively. Um, and so it was thought to be the flattening of the chamber and the hypotony were both thought to be from an overfiltering bleb. After that, after about three weeks, um, the trap had been stable. His uh, intraocular pressures had been in the four to six range, like we mentioned. The choroidals had, had settled down and his AC remained formed. Uh, throughout. So um, in summary, right now we have a 62-year-old male who had this complicated course after TRAP, uh, has now been stable for at least three months, and has a visual acuity of 2400 in that left eye, wanting cataract surgery. So my question to the panel and the audience would be, you know, what would you do next? Uh, would you proceed with cataract surgery with the toric IOL first and then kind of deal with the astigmatism um, in the post-op period, would you attempt suture lysis for this patient and reevaluate the astigmatism preoperatively and then plan for cataract surgery? Uh, would you place a monofocal IOL and then treat the astigmatism later on? Or would you just observe and not do anything at this time? I can uh, take a stab at this. Um, I'm sorry, Cindy, you wanna go ahead? Nope. No, I would, I would probably, for this patient, I think the, the key here is the pressure is between four and six millimeters of mercury. So I think it's hard to evaluate the astigmatism with, when the eye is hypotenuse like this. I think you may find that if the pressure comes up to, let's say, the 10 or 12 range, the astigmatism may change. So the astigmatism is caused by, may, you know, obviously, if the scleral flap sutures were tight, that can cause astigmatism. 
I don't know what kind of closure was done in tuberculectomy, whether it was a limbal based or 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 a fornix based uh, flap. But early in the postoperative period, you can get a lot, a lot of astigmatism from the sutures that you use to close the conjunctiva. It sounds like in this case, though, this, the astigmatism is being, is being induced by the scleral flap sutures in the setting of hypotony as well. So I would vote D uh, to observe not perform cataract surgery at this time. Let's see if the pressure comes up. And if so, evaluate how the vision is at that point. The sill will change. I would definitely not do a toric IOL because um, I think the astigmatism here is going to change as those sutures uh, are either dealt with in the future as the pressure comes up or if that bleb is revised in the future to bring the intraocular pressure up. I'm going to take a contrarian view. So I think, you know, with the decline in vision that we're seeing here and the potential for improvement, I would definitely want to do cataract surgery because, you know, for most of us, 2400 vision is, is pretty lousy. And I think, you know, there's uh, an opportunity to really improve things for this patient. Um, oftentimes, if we do cataract surgery, if there's enough uh, post-operative inflammation, we might actually solve the hypotony issue. Um, so I would definitely consider doing cataract surgery in terms of which option to choose. I think all of, you know, A, B, and C are all reasonable choices. Um, obviously, they all have pros and cons to them. Um, I'm really interested in, in option B. I think that's a really uh, kind of a interesting strategy. I know that, um, you know, once you're, you know, after about four to six weeks out after a trab, it's often the case that suture lysis will not significantly impact the pressure. Um, many of us, you know, the patient didn't come back for follow-up, you know, their pressure is too high. It's been like, you know, a month after their trab, you go to, you cut all the sutures and nothing happens, which is very frustrating. Um, whereas there are case reports where somebody lysed a suture a year after a trab, and this is why it's a case report and the pressure came down because it's, it's really uncommon. Um, so I think you actually may be able to um, lyse these sutures without a significant impact on the, uh, the pressure. Um, so uh, I think that that's very interesting to me. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to do torix um, unless you have a pretty good sense of, you know, where things are at. So, um, you know, I think uh, probably dealing, doing B or C would make the most sense to me. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about option B. I think that's, that's very provocative. One thing I noticed on the corneal topography is that, um, you know, sometimes when there's real hypotony causing um, the astigmatism, and I'm sure it's contributing that there's the pressure's low, but if you looked at the um, topography, it's very regular. There's no flat, there's not a a real flattening right adjacent to the trab flap. Um, yeah, so, oops, there we go. So um, sometimes when you have that real um, unstable, bad type of astigmatism, um, you'll see a lot of red upright adjacent to the, um, to the trab flap. And we don't see that here. So I, I agree that it's almost certainly related to the tight sutures. Um, three months out, I might try to let the patient go a little longer, but if they're complaining bitterly about this vision, and I agree it's lousy, um, then I might sequentially start laser suture lysis in preparation for doing cataract surgery. But I wouldn't be in a huge rush just because three months and a nice over-filtering bleb, you don't know what's going to happen. So I would do them one at a time, slowly. Um, you know, back in the day when we did extra caps, um, you know, you intentionally induced astigmatism and then slowly let it off by doing suture lysis. So, um, so it's not unheard of to do that. Okay, so thank you all. Um, yeah, this, this is definitely a very interesting case and um, we actually went ahead with option B. So we'll see how this panned out for this patient. Um, our patient was very, um, he really wanted the cataract out and he really wanted his vision to be improved. Um, he was definitely not comfortable with being in that 2400 range for any longer. Um, so we started out doing like you, um, like the panel mentioned, kind of sequential suture lysis. Uh, we spoke to him before we even lysed the first suture, kind of prepared him that we didn't know how his eye was going to respond as far as the pressure. 
um, would, was concerned um, after the suture lysis and that he may need to be reformed and things like that. But um, he actually did really well. Um, so the first, we after lysing two sutures, we see here that we repeated the corneal topography. Um, each time we lysed the sutures, we had him wait a couple hours in the clinic and then had him come back the following week just to make sure he was doing okay. Um, after lysing the two nasal sutures, his um, the corneal striae kind of started settling down and his astigmatism decreased to 6.37. Um, the following week, we then lysed the last suture, which was the third suture, and um, his astigmatism improved to 5.08. And then we waited, okay. we waited a month after that and repeated the, the topography and his astigmatism was down to 4.7. So there was definitely the thought obviously looking back now is that there were multiple components to this and we'll get to you know, different causes for astigmatism after, after traps, but definitely the, the scleral flap sutures were contributing to the high astigmatism that this patient had. So going into astigmatism after trabeculectomy surgery, um, you know, studies have reported that the induced astigmatism is usually seen in a with the rule uh, fashion after trabeculectomy surgeries, and the, the astigmatism usually stabilizes at about three months post-op, and it's usually between the 1.5 to 2.5 diopter range. Um, causes for induced astigmatism include um, removal of the tissue from under the scleral flap, which can cause the corneal edge of the trab opening to sink slightly, causing steepening of the vertical uh, corneal meridian. Um, the next thought was, you know, excessive cautery or overly tight flap sutures can cause scleral contraction and steepening in that in the meridian of the surgery. And then um, hypotony, like we've discussed before with the panel, has been shown to cause uh, the eye to be more susceptible to deformation and astigmatic changes. And we actually had a study that came out of UIC by Dr. Kang and um, the, and the cornea and the glaucoma department, and they reported on development of irregular astigmatism in the setting of ocular hypotony after glaucoma filtering surgery. And they showed that the induced irregular astigmatism was more related to older age and uh, low central corneal thickness. So ways to reduce induced astigmatism, um, one of these includes using uh, mitomycin C, which can delay wound healing and so reduces the degree to which uh, epithelial tissue contracts and scars down, um, and that can, which can then uh, deform the cornea. Um, you doing a smaller sclerostomy or using an expression which would give you a more predictable sclerostomy site um, would reduce the wound gape and the sinking uh, from removal of the tissue, and then avoiding excessive cautery and overly tight scleral flap sutures would also help. So because our uh, patient showed significant improvement in corneal astigmatism after uh, suture lysis, we looked at studies that have commented on the role of suture lysis and also location of the scleral flap in induced astigmatism. And we found that the location of the flap closer to 12 o'clock can steepen the vertical meridian. Few studies have reported that suture lysis doesn't really affect corneal astigmatism, um, but these were smaller studies with small sample sizes and the magnitude of induced astigmatism was between one to 1.5 diopters. So they attributed most of this to uh, removal of the tissue for the sclerostomy. And then we, we don't really find good references for this, but just based on clinical experience, um, in terms of timing uh, cataract surgery after suture lysis, um, you know, based on the discussions we had, we thought the cornea usually stabilizes one to two weeks after suture lysis, and it would be okay to go ahead and plan for cataract surgery one month um, after, after, you know, complete suture lysis. Uh, treatment options for patients uh, with astigmatism include, you know, glasses, contact lenses, and then uh, toric IOLs is certainly an option. So just to wrap up um, with an update on our patient, he underwent cataract surgery in the left eye on the 26th of April. Uh, we placed an SN6 189 uh, toric IOL at the 142 degree axis. And for, based on the calculations, we calculated residual astigmatism of about one diopter. Um, and at post-op week one visit, his uncorrected visual acuity was 2030. Um, and his IOP has remained stable at six. So he's very happy.
right. Thank you so much to Dr. Mehta for that excellent talk. Um, we should mention for those that are, were on the edge of their seat about what happened after the suture lysis, that the pressure still hovered around four-ish, three, four. Um, chamber did not shallow, there were no choroidals. I mean, the patient tolerated it well as though, you know, it was, everything was already in place. So um, very interesting talk for, for all of us here at the VA who saw this patient. Um, we are a little bit behind, so we're going to go ahead with uh, Dr. Guyman's uh, presentation next. Um, he's the last of the clinical challenges series here. Larry, if you could share your screen. Thank you. Can everybody hear me and see my screen? Yes, okay. My name is uh, Larry Guyman. I'm one of the uh, senior residents at UIC. I'll be doing the third case presentation. I want to thank Dr. V, Dr. Edward Abbasin, and Dr. Henry for inviting me to give this talk and uh, case presentation and also for the case. So the history here, this is a patient who's referred to us for IOP control. He's a 60-year-old male uh, with a past ocular history of nanothalmos, diagnosed with glaucoma a few years ago and was referred for IOP control. He was initially treated with latanoprost um, in 2017, but that was complicated by choroidal effusion per the notes. And currently he's on no eye medications. He denies any symptoms aside from uh, unchanged floaters for a while. Past ocular history, the nanothalmos and a very high hypopia, as we'll soon see. He has a past medical history of asthma and hypertension, NPDR in his father. Not any medications, and he does have uh, sulfa allergies that are noted. He's uh, correctable to 2040 with an extremely high hyperopic um, uh, refraction. Pupils are fine, the pressure is 26 and 32, and normal to fix CCGs, otherwise unremarkable data. Uh, externally, he had very deep set globes and nanophthalmic eyes, a uh, fairly shallow anterior chamber, um, and gonioscopy revealed uh, essentially no uh, structures that were visible aside from some structures in the right eye and depression and PAS that we could see on the left. Uh, notably, he had only trace NS, maybe trace to one plus NS in the eyes. Um, dilate exams are not done uh, given the extremely narrow uh, um, angles. And so undilated exam for the clear vitreous, um, small discs in both eyes. The left eye did seem to have a focal superior notch with an increased cup to disc. So there's some asymmetry there. So we ordered um, several diagnostics on that first day that he was referred to us. Uh, we have the CPR and the cell thickness here. That right nasal thickness to me looks artifactual given that it basically abruptly goes to zero, but you know, perhaps there's some mild generalized thinning in the right eye, maybe a little bit in the left, a little bit more than we would expect for age. The macular asymmetry is not too revealing. As far as the visual fields, um, the right eye possibly, uh, this is only the first time we've, we've done visual fields, uh, an early supranasal step and possibly very early inferior changes that would uh, correspond to the slightly more thin global RNFL thickness in the right eye, left eye with a very um, gross rim artifact. The eye well master uh, pretty uh, astoundingly shows that he has very, very short axial length, 16.62 in the right eye and 16.67 uh, in the left eye, um, consistent with his nanophthalmos. And most interesting of all, we have uh, B-scans on the day presentation, which shows uh, gross chordal thickening and an overall small globe in the right eye, and similarly in the left eye. Unfortunately, we did not, um, we were not able to measure it on this um, uh, clinic day, but we can see that qualitatively very thick choroids. UBM was done, uh, which shows a crowded uh, and closed angle. Um, a very high lens vault and possibly pupillary block on some um, cuts. Uh, the in central anterior chamber depth, 2.17, so very, very shallow. Left eye, similar, and also a similarly shallow central anterior chamber, 2.26 millimeters. So on that visit, the patient was started on bromonidine. We're a little limited in what we could offer. The asthma, Timolol, wasn't a great option with the sulfa allergy the carbonic anhydrous inhibitors less so, and we did have this history of uveal effusions on the tanoprost, so we elected for bromonidine. Returned about a month later with improved pressures in both eyes, especially the left eye, and we had him follow up in a, in a month or so for another IOP check with follow-up echography. So this is him following up a month after that. Vision roughly the same. 
it does bat down to a fairly significant degree in the right eye, especially the left, and the pressures remain stable on just Ramon and BID. We got additional diagnostics with V scans, and today we did measure the chordal thickness of 1.53 millimeters. Still see it's qualitatively very, very thick. Here's a cut through the optic nerve. And same in the left eye, very, very thick cords, measured at 1.94. Uh, another cut through the optic nerve there, similarly thick choroids. And so essentially, we have a nanophthalmic eye with ocular hypertension. Angle closure on gonioscopy also can, is evident on the B-scan. Pretty much has uvular fusion or choroidal thickness, uh, you know, a component uh, to the nanophthalmus right now, and um, has a history of medication intolerance to latanoprost. Probably, you know, timolol won't be the uh, strongest option and the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors with the sulfa. Um, so there's some medication intolerance and in treating his angle closure and his ocular hypertension, what would you do next? Um, you know, our options, uh, we were thinking about at the time, do we do laser peripheral autonomy? Uh, do we move ahead to cataract extraction? Uh, do we do some kind of glaucoma surgery as well? And then secondarily, um, have any of our panelists seen uvular fusions with the uh, prostaglandin analogs, especially in very uh, small amount of talmud eyes? So this is a tough one. <laughs> That's probably an understatement. Um, those axial lengths are extraordinarily small. I've never operated on someone that with that short an eye. Um, and I don't, the uvula fusion thing with latanoprost, I've never seen that either, but um, these patients uh, can get uvula fusions for lots of reasons. And um, I would not, um, I, I think it's a, a warning sign that you will probably get a uvula fusion with almost anything you do. So I think with that in mind, um, the lens is going to have to come out at some point. And I think the, the, at the point that it seems like it's the risk is worth it um, because it's only as the cataract gets more dense, it's going to be a really, really tough case. So I would definitely not wait too long to um, proceed with surgery. And if I was going to do surgery, I would definitely put in at least two scleral windows um, at the time of the case. And I would be prepared for um, a difficult procedure. I'd use um, dense viscoelastic um, to make sure I have that on hand. Um, I would have retina backup ready to go. Um, and I'd proceed with caution, but somebody's gonna have to do it in order to take care of this patient is my impression. As far as lens implants, that's gonna be the other factor, right? Um, I would never want to do a piggyback on an eye this small. So be sure that you just pick the strongest lens available that you're comfortable with. Um, and you know the patient's gonna be thrilled no matter what, right? They're plus 14 or 15 now. Um, any reduction in that is gonna be um, a good thing for them and possibly be able to have contact lens treatment after that. So I agree with uh, Cindy, this is a really tough case. Um, I think, you know, my approach would be to first do no harm, which is the patient is not in, you know, a situation right now where you necessarily have to do anything. I found the RNFL OCT actually quite reassuring. I think some of the visual field defects were artifactual, probably got pretty tired by the time that you got to the left eye with the plus, you know, 14. A diopter lens in front of them um, and probably some rim artifact there. Um, fortunately, there's not a whole lot of astigmatism in this case, so we don't have to worry about that for this one. Um, you know, I, I, you know the, I would jokingly say I would really wait until the patient has a visually significant cataract as long as the pressure is uh, under control, you know, hoping that they or uh, potentially you had moved by that time and would no longer have to be responsible for this patient. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think you can always make the patient worse. I always try to remind our trainees that. And I think, you know, as much as it's exciting to do a laser iridoplasty, it's cool, it's fun. I just think you're, you're playing with fire here. So I'd really wait until, you know, you really have to pull the trigger on something. But I agree that it's, it's not going to get easier over time. But 
Um, I, you know, with the vision being 2030, 2040 right now, uh, the pressure's controlled on medication. Um, I, I'd be pretty happy to just sit for a little bit. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with, with both Cindy and Yao's comments. I, I mean, I think uh, it is a, a very tough case. Um, you know, I think doing a, a LPI maybe uh, is something I, I would definitely consider. I mean, when this patient presented, their pressures were up in the 30s and there's no visualization of angle structures. And I think that, you know, the longer we wait, the more there's gonna be PAS that forms. And um, if this patient does go into acute angle closure, and then you have to deal with, try to deal with the lens at that time, that's gonna make it even more challenging. So um, I think uh, while there's certainly a risk that the LPI could trigger, could trigger malignant glaucoma or uvula effusions or who knows, um, I think that you probably wanna do something sooner rather than later um, because it could be a much more challenging situation if you delay and they present in a more challenging state. With the LPI, would you make any adjustment to your standard technique, any preoperative or postoperative change in, in management? Steroids or something of the sort, Dimox? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a ton of experience with these these patients. Um, I I think uh, you just need to watch them very carefully. Um, he's he's not in any blood thinners or anything like that. Um, but you know, I think uh, if you see the pressure goes up immediately afterwards, you know, be be right on top of that. And um, I think you have to prepare the patient and and explain that, you know, that additional interventions may be needed uh, either, you know, with medically and or surgically uh, if, you know, if, if uh, things, you know, if, if uh, the situation becomes unstable. I would, I would consider an argon laser first before I, I do the YAG for the LPI just to thin out the tissue and then and follow up with the YAG. And I think that usually temporizes any kind of post-operative spike too. Great, I think we can finish up the case, Dr. Gaiman. I don't know if we can hear you, Dr. Gaiman. Oh, sorry. Um, there is, um, there's a fair amount of literature on nanothelmus and glaucoma. Um, it's not the most common scenario, so there's not a whole lot. Um, typically, the theories behind why um, glaucoma occurs in these patients relate to the high lens uh, to globe volume ratio and the uvula effusions, uh, which can anteriorly displace the iris and directly close the angle or displace the lens anteriorly was irritolenticular contact and pupillary block. And as has been mentioned um, a couple times, these patients are exquisitely prone to intra and post-operative complications, uh, explosive hemorrhage, aqueous misdirection, shallow interior chamber, uvula fusions. So jumping into surgery, you know, it's, it's something that takes a lot of deliberation. Um, the literature does say, you know, consider the LPI early to treat any component of pupillary block since LPI is certainly less invasive than a surgery. Might as well treat something that we can if there's any component of pupillary block. 
Um, subsequent management, as has been alluded, can include iridoplasty. There's a small literature on that. The idea being that if we, um, you know, can basically remove and kind of move the peripheral iris tissue away from the angle, um, that can be of some assistance. Or cataract extraction or dedicated glaucoma procedure. Generally speaking, the recommendation is to proceed with caution as we move into the more invasive uh, surgeries. Um, also, as I mentioned, you can consider preoperative drainage of choroidals. You can consider scleral windows. Those have been all described uh, in these patients, as well as it's been also alluded to steroid administration, uh, since inflammation can cause worsening of uvular effusions, can cause worsening of um, the choroidal edema. Consider starting a patient on um, either topical or even PO steroids um, has been described, uh, even if there is no uh, uvular effusion or choroidal uh, thickening before surgery just as a way to prevent it from happening afterwards. These are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all our amazing resident uh, presentations. Um, if there aren't any pressing questions at this time, then we'll go ahead and turn it back to Tassarat uh, to conclude our webinar. Thank you, Tassarat. Thank you so much, Javani and Mike and all the panelists. Uh, three amazing cases. Thank you for joining us. And um, I would also like to thank everyone who are attending the 29th Dental and Ear Infirmary Glaucoma Symposium. Hope you enjoy the uh, symposium and they're going to be a recording uh, posted later and just follow the link. Um, I would also like to really thank um, the speaker um, and all of you joining us, our team, Peter Mon. I don't know if he can show the video. We would like to really thank him for making these virtual meeting really smoothly, go smoothly. Uh, Lauren Kalinowski, uh, Laurie Walker, and also Anita Horta for, for their hard work. Really appreciate it. And uh, hope to see you uh, next year in person. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.